Um, we are moving on now to items 8, 9 and 10, members, which is uh, agenda items which were uh, SRs that are in front of us today. So I propose that we discuss the items together, but we then will decide separately on each of them. These three agenda items are statutory rules which amend the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Regulations 2020 as follows. Agenda item number eight is SR 2020 forward slash 82. This is amendment number two to the regulations and includes provision for the opening of places of worship for marriage ceremonies for, for the terminally ill, the reopening of recycling centres and clarification of the application of the enforcement provision with regard to children. This SR came into operation on the 15th of May and the papers relating to that can be found at tab 8 of your packs. Item agenda number 9 is SR 2020 forward slash 84. This is amendment number 3 to the regulations and provides for private acts of worship and drive-in church services, gatherings of up to six people from different households outdoors and outdoor activities. This SR came into operation on the 19th of May and the papers relating to that SR can be found at tab 9 of your pack. Agenda item number 10 then is SR 2020 forward slash 86 and this is amendment number 4 to the regulations and provides for the staging of drive-in events such as live concerts, theatre performances and films. This SR came into operation on the 21st of May. These SRs were all made under the emergency provision of the Public Health Act 1967. The Department has advised that due to the urgency of the situation addressed by the SRs, there was no time to bring SL1s to the Committee. The Examiner of Statutory Rules has not yet reported on any of these SRs, and each SR is subject to the confirmatory procedure. I can advise members that a departmental official is here today by teleconference to provide a short briefing on each of the SRs and to address any questions that members might have. And just for, for the purposes of, of uh, we, we're going to discuss the, uh, the three items together and then we will decide on them separately. Can I just check that we have Pat on the phone? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, and, and do we have Orlea on the phone? Yes, sure, thank yeah. you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And I suppose just before we bring Nigel in, I, I suppose in terms of a, a message to the public, and we, there are growing anecdotal signs that, that many members of the public are, there's much more activity in shops, there's much more travel and traffic. And I think it's incumbent on us as a committee just to ask the public to consider that these easements that we're just discussing today are very targeted, very gradual, and they've been taken in, in a decision-making process. And despite high-profile examples of where things have been done in a way that, that, that they shouldn't have been done, I think it's incumbent on us to remind the public that the, we are still in a position here of having to protect public health, having to protect our health service, and having to control the transmission of this virus within the capabilities that we have. So I would just urge members of the public to consider that and to stick with these, which are undoubtedly difficult measures, but these are the measures that have enabled us to, to arrive at a situation where we are today. But we must acknowledge the fact of having so many people who have lost loved ones as a result of this virus. And our first duty is to protect as far as possible from further deaths. So in, in, that, in light of that, I would then like to ask Nigel McMahon, who is the Chief Environmental Health Officer, to brief the committee on these SRs today. Go ahead there, Nigel, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank, thank you to the, to the committee. Um, hopefully it would be helpful to the committee if I could just start by giving a brief overview about the decision-making process that's now in place that results in these amendments being made, and hopefully that sets a bit of context uh, uh, for these three SRs. Um, so the Chair has said the Health Protection Coronavirus Restriction Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 were made and came into operation on the 28th of uh, March, you'll recall. Um, the need for, for the restrictions and requirements that are imposed by the regulations uh, are also required to be reviewed at least every 21 days 
and the first. Major, sorry for interrupting. You've dropped away on us there. Just, just uh, in the last part of that sentence. Whatever happened. Oh, okay. That's better. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just sort of recapping that there's a statutory requirement to review the regulations and the restrictions uh, every 21 days, and the first formal review was due by the 18th of April. So. The first review um, very much focused on the progression of the outbreak at that time, the modelling uh, as to what um, was likely to happen, the effectiveness of the regulations uh, in terms of social distancing, and the professional advice from the chief medical officer and the chief scientific advisor. And the executive agreed uh, with the conclusions and recommendations of that first review on the 15th of April, which was that the restrictions that were in place um, at that time should all be maintained. Um, subsequent to that first review, the scope of, of the reviews has been broadened. Uh, now it takes account um, of the impacts of, yes, of course, the restrictions uh, in terms of health, but also the impacts on wider society and the economy. The executive has agreed a decision-making framework that includes guiding principles, a risk and benefit assessment model, and a structured process for assessing and withdrawing specific restrictions and requirements as soon as each of these is considered to be no longer necessary for the purpose of the regulations. The so decisions to introduce or withdraw or amend existing restrictions or requirements have been implemented either through um, public messaging, through the issue of guidance, or by legislative change which has involved amendments to the principal regulations. So the committee uh, has previously considered the first set of amendments which allowed for burial grounds and graveyards to be open to members of the public and clarified the circumstances in which someone can leave the place where they live to take exercise. Uh, due to the pressures on departmental and indeed committee time, the committee has very kindly agreed to facilitate the department's request to consider um, these three sets of further amendment regulations made following executive decisions. So I'm very grateful to the committee for that. Um, and I'm just going to quickly uh, recap on what each of the um, SRs includes in terms of uh, changes that, that have been made to the main regulations. So SR 2020 um, number 82, which is the amendment number two regulations. Um, with regard to those, the executive considered a number of potential changes to the regulations in light of proposals received from uh, other departments the changes in other jurisdictions and advice from the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor. Ministers um, very much recognise that the success of the regulations comes at a cost to individual citizens and to many aspects of our uh, normal day-to-day -day life. With that in mind and recognising that the core restrictions are likely to be needed for some time yet, the Executive decided at that stage to make a number of changes. So the amendment number two regulations were made and came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 15th of May, and four main changes were introduced then. To allow a place of worship to open for a marriage ceremony where a party is terminally ill, with a total number of people present limited to 10. To add as a reasonable excuse the need to access services provided by a district council or another public body, including household waste or recycling centres, to allow garden centres and ornamental plant nurseries to open, and to clarify that the reference to auction houses in the regulations does not include livestock markets, whether for its slaughter or for breeding. There were also a number of additional um, legal technical amendments and clarifications made at that time, and I can go through those separately if the committee would like me to. Um, moving on then to uh, SR 2020-84, the number three amendment regulations, they were made and came into operation at 11 p.m. on the 19th of May, and uh, four further changes were introduced then. To allow places of worship to open for acts of individual prayer, to allow people to take part in an outdoor activity, to allow up to six people not from the same household to meet outdoors, and to allow drive-in church services where the participants must remain in their vehicles throughout the service and the occupants of each vehicle are members of the same household. Um, SR 2020-86 then is amendment regulations number four. Um, they came into operation at 11pm on the 21st of May 
and there was a single change introduced um, at that time, and that was to allow drive-in performances of music and theatre and drive-in cinema, again, where those attending remain in their vehicles throughout the performance uh, or the screening, and the occupants of each vehicle are members of the same household. Um, thank you for listening, and thank you, thank you again for agreeing to take the three sets of amendment regulations together today. I'm quite happy to, to try to answer any questions uh, committee members may have. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Um, I suppose in, in terms of, and, and I appreciate that you've set out there the decision-making process, but, and, and, and if, if it's not yourself maybe who has this information, maybe we, we can raise it with the Chief Scientific Advisor, but how is that decision-making program, decision-making process linked to the scientific evidence of where we are at at any given time with the rate of transmission known as the R number? So in terms of deciding what, what impact a, a easement might have on that number, or indeed tracking what impact it does have when it's brought in. How does that process align? Yeah. Okay, Chair. Um, the, um, the process has been agreed with the other departments, includes uh, the submission of um, information and evidence by way of a template to try and sort of structure the submissions that come through. So it puts the onus on individual departments who want to bring forward a proposal for a, for a, a, a change, um, uh, either the introduction of something, the withdrawal of something, or the amendment of something, uh, to make a case essentially, uh, to set out the reason why they're suggesting this, to provide any evidence that's available um, to them on that, and to complete, um, uh, in, their, in their opinion, um, a uh, risk matrix in terms of the impact that, that the proposal might have in terms of health and the economy and wider wider society. Once the because the regulations are Department of Health regulations, once we receive um, those proposals from departments, um, we then uh, scrutinise them from a public health point of view. So that involves input from the chief scientific advisor and the chief medical advisor. Um, in, in, in terms of the things that we've mentioned, where we are in terms of the progression of the <coughs> pandemic um, and uh, any updated medical advice that we have. And on the basis of that, then, the Department of Health brings forward a paper to the executive, um, either recommending um, that, that the executive approve um, a proposal um, or indeed suggesting that it either be um, deferred um, or not progressed. And in that case, then, of course, we, we, uh, we, we provide the health advice as to why um, we, we come to that, that conclusion. So broadly, that's, that's the process. In terms of um, future process, and obviously the executive are required to meet um, at least every three weeks to consider this, but in practice are considering progress effectively at every meeting that they, that they have. So um, there is an opportunity then um, for, for them to reflect um, on, on items that have been deferred previously, or indeed any evidence about how um, uh, things have been, been introduced. Uh, the general advice coming from the Department of Health um, uh, to the executive has been that when we do make these relaxations, it would typically, we would typically need at least um, um, three weeks, um, the, the interval between reviews, in order to, to see whether the relaxation has had any um, obvious impact uh, on the R value. Um, and decisions on, on further relaxations would be dependent um, on, on that, that advice at, at subsequent meetings. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, the final one from me for now is in relation to, um, I know within, within the executive plan, the, uh, the kind of six steps that were identified by the World Health Organization are included there, including uh, community engagement and, and the importance of community engagement. So, in relation to the fact that these are very specific easements, very gradual, and in in the context of not them not being un, misunderstood as a general relaxation, how are the department engaging with harder to reach communities on the nuances and the specifics of each of these relaxations in terms of languages, even in terms of you know uh, people from other countries or people with communication difficulties of any sort? What strategy have you for communicating the uh, the actual impact of each of these regulations? Um, I say the process now involves um, sponsor departments, if you like, coming forward um, with information on proposals for relaxation, and some of that um, will include representations that have been made to those departments or issues raised by members of the of the. Um, 
of, of the public. There is also um, an onus on that parent department if the relaxation goes ahead um, to deal with the with um, uh, any sort of stakeholder engagement and communications that are uh, are involved uh, in that relaxation. So you will have seen um, in recent times various ministers coming out um, making statements about. Um, Things that are, are likely to um, to reopen, or, or guidance has been produced by individual departments relating to individual uh, uh, sectors. Um, I, I I can't really speak to the issue about um, uh, other languages and so on. I suppose that that's a matter for individual departments about, and um, given the nature of the relaxation, whether they feel that's something that they need to do when preparing their guidance. Yeah, and I suppose I would just I would just urge that that is given very careful consideration, and either the executive or the department ensure that that those that those messages are getting accurately across, because we're we're concerned that there you could see a, a kind of a negative domino effect where people see things being eased up and think that that a phase has passed and it's okay to do other things. So I think that's quite important in relation to those communities. I'm going to come now to Colin McGrath here in the room, and then I'm going to check in with the members on the phone, and then I'll come back to the room. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you to Nigel for the presentation. I suppose we are in this bizarre scenario where um, the regulations have actually been in, um, enacted, and, as it were, and then we're coming afterwards for the permission, and I appreciate that leaves us in a, in a difficult scenario, but it is where we are. Um, and, and I'm going to maybe uh, get the label you need to potentially as the font of all knowledge because um, through my own committee and the executive office we've been trying to find is there a person that knows the answers um, to various uh, relaxations that occur in the regulations and I'm sure all members here will agree with me but whenever there are changes you end up getting a big two dozen, three dozen people contacting saying, does this mean me? Does this mean my family? Can I do this? Can I do that? Um, and sometimes the changes are quite sort of broad, but, but they're not specific, and then we don't know what happens. And one such case that I've been um, dealing with is in the issue of those um, that carry out um, personal training for people on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, and they're kind of wondering, you know, that the, the relaxation which allows up to six people to be outside, does that mean, for example, that if there was a gym, that they would be able to, to put their gear outside in the, in the car park and work with up to six people in the outdoors using the equipment uh, for, for a fee uh, for their business? Is that considered something that's permissible under the rules as they stand at the minute? Um, thank you. Um, I suppose I have to caveat anything I say by um, much as I would like to be the fund of all knowledge and such things. Uh, clearly, you know there are some businesses that may need to seek <laughs> may, may, yeah, may, may need to seek may need to seek their own legal advice. Um, but uh, in terms of my own personal view, I I, I, um, I would say that certainly the lift the, the uh, lifting of the restriction that allows people to to uh, carry out or activity and to do that with um, up to six people from other households uh, potentially provides the opportunity for personal trainers to to um, take such exercise uh, um, sessions um, outdoors um, it's also permissible as you as you will know to to travel for the purposes of work so um, as a personal trainer could travel to a location for that that purpose um, as well and of course the other people involved will be taking exercise the one area of what you said that i would have some concern about is that the uh, the caveat uh, the executive put put on this was to try and avoid um, contact with shared half surfaces hard surfaces and i think it would be the, the sharing of equipment um, outdoors uh, if, it, if indeed it is shared and that might be the issue. That might be the issue there that we need to be looked at more closely. Of course, if people are bringing their own um, mats and gym gear and one thing or another, then, then that's maybe a different story. But my, the one area of concern I would have would be if the gym are actually providing equipment that uh, the participants would then be would then be sharing, and that would need to be considered more closely. Thank you. Thank you, Blake. Thank you, Nigel. I'm going now to the phones to check with a uh, Pat. Do you have anything there in relation to this? I'll try uh, Orlea. Are you on the phone, Orlea? Yeah, Sorry, you're there, Pat. Okay, go ahead. Just a wee second on mute. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's, it's more a general point uh, than anything, and the, the concern has already been expressed that with the relaxation of these specific measures, it creates a mindset that, you know, the doors open a bit and if we push a wee bit more, it'll open further and so on. And we've seen over the past day or two footage from across the water 
some of the beaches uh, they're like Bannadorm in August packed in like sardines there and I suppose that's partly due to the shenanigans that's been in the press over the last few days but partly also due to the, the tech handed way that the, the government across the water has handled those, this whole pan- pandemic from the outset so I think it's important that the executive are clearly communicating with the public here that this is a different situation here, that we're creating the rules here ourselves and that we're nowhere near the end of this situation. It's still very dangerous and and people need to uh, take heed of the messages that are coming out. Uh, and, and, And I think that's something that the executive needs to focus on over the next while. Can I go, Margaret? Okay, Gormagut, Pat Martian, August Tommy, Golgaji, Orlea, Anish. Orlea, are you there? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Colin already touched on it there. It was the, the first point I wanted to make was just around the the, the breakdown of the meaning and the regulation um, and regulation five part two about that to take part in an outdoor activity and you know how people will. Um, you know, people have different assumptions of, of, of how you define that. So I don't know if if you can be any more specific within the regulation. And then I know that brings its own difficulties as well. It's just the time that we're in. But so maybe just around that, to, to define more specifically what that outdoor activity is. And then I was just wondering, have you any guidance um, that's been drafted up? Um, for, or have people been contacting um, the department with queries um, asking for details around, you know, like what would be a reasonable outdoor um, broadcasting service or how do you run a reasonable outdoor mass service or whatever that may be. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Nigel. Okay. Um, in terms of outdoor activity, um, that is a difficult one and we had lots of long discussions about that. Um, as you can imagine, um, a number of departments were already receiving a significant number of representations uh, in relation to all sorts of uh, activities and relaxations. Um, as already has, uh, has indicated, the difficulty, I suppose, then is once you start to to create a list, uh, you know, for, for every one thing on that list, there'll be 10 or 20 more um, that will come forward and say, well, what about this? Um, we decided in policy terms in the end that the focus really here was on the public health risk and the fact that the relaxation recognized that the risk for somebody being outdoors um, and taking part in an activity where social distancing is, is relatively straightforward um, uh, means that it could be more a more generic a broader relaxation rather than this listing specific um, activities but you're quite right in the sense that it hasn't stopped <laughs> the flow of queries coming in uh, with people just checking if certain things are um, able to be carried out or not um, we are looking at the possibility of drawing up some uh, broader guidance to help to support that, which we'd like to issue soon. And I know that um, the executive are also considering, you know, maybe putting something on on NI Direct that can be updated uh, to sort of answer people's uh, questions about some of the the detail. But but the outdoor activity was more around, um, you know, giving the message that that sensible precautions taken for outdoors is relatively low risk um, pretty much regardless of the uh, the, uh, the nature of the activity um, with regard to uh, well I think I've maybe answered the second question there um, about um, oh no sorry the second question wasn't it was about um, uh, guidance to, uh, about um, driving services was that right and, yeah. and yeah. churches and whatnot um, yeah um, well, the, the, the drive-in services is something that, again, there were representations uh, about, and um, I, I can tell from the media that a number of those are taking taking place now. Um, so it seemed like a sort of a reasonable request. It is a permissive thing, of course. You know, if the, if the church happens to have the facility to accommodate that and happens to have um, the, the, the wherewithal to provide the uh, the, the means to uh, to do that, then they can. Of course, uh, that won't be the case in every case um, we haven't as yet um, had a request for um, any more detailed guidance um, in relation to that uh, it, it seems on the face of it a fairly 
fairly straightforward um, change to the regulations that if, if people are in a position to provide that facility or service, then there's certainly nothing in these regulations that will prohibit them from doing so. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you. Hey, Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, two questions in regards to uh, SR82 and 86. Um, 82 mentions barbers and tannin services. Um, when, when will that be? And, you know, people, many people, myself included, are obviously in dire need of a haircut, but I think I'd be concerned that um, it's not an essential service, um, and that um, you know how do you do, how do you socially distance in a barber? I mean, a barber is a small um, a small uh, area, and uh, people sort of normally are, are sort of squeezed in tightly. So, um, how does that uh, work? Uh, how do you socially distance in a barber's? And, and I'd be concerned that there's a bit of a hurried approach towards um, uh, some of this stuff. Um, also, uh, garden centres are, are mentioned, and obviously it's the case that garden centres um, have opened or, or can open. Uh, but I'd be concerned that some companies, I mean, I know the likes of Madeline, for example, are saying that they're a garden uh, or a homeware um, centre at least, and by all intents and purposes, they're a closed shop. So how do we get around the companies, if not flouting the, the rules, that certainly sort of sidestepping them or, or reclassifying their, their normal business? Um, and just on 86, uh, sorry, 86, uh, sort of similar concern that Orlea raised. Um, I mean, I suppose outdoor uh, cinemas is pretty um, um, explanatory itself, but how do we ensure that outdoor concerts don't turn into a situation where people, you know, to put it frankly, are, are getting out of their cars and, you know, joining in, if you will? So a few uh, answers to that would be helpful. Thanks. Dan Nigel. Okay, thank you. Um, in relation to different types of businesses, and I think you mentioned barbers and other things, and I, I, can, I can understand why there's a, um, a strong feeling out there uh, about reopening such, such businesses, and I'm glad this isn't a video call. Um, but uh, cl clearly the focus is on public health, is on public health risk there, and in terms of reopening certain types of premises. Uh, it'll still come down to uh, the risk assessment at the end of the day, um, and some types of businesses obviously are likely to be much further down the down the line. Um, and uh, certainly, from the Department of Health point of view, we wouldn't like to put any sort of dates or time scales on those things. It'll very much depend um, on, on how things change with the, the spread of the, the disease. I would point out that the regulations do require us to lift the restrictions just as soon as we conclude that it's safe to do so. Um, hence the urgent procedure being used for the amendment regulations so far. So um, I would just repeat the line, I suppose, that we, we, uh, we don't plan to have any of the restrictions in place any longer than is deemed strictly necessary for public health um, reasons. In terms of mixed retail, that, that, is a, um, that is a tricky one, and it depends, I suppose, where you, where you come from on that. Um, the bottom line, I think, as far as the, the, uh, the, the regulations are concerned, it, 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 very, it would be very difficult to require some premises to, to close um, where they, part of their business is something that is allowed to stay open under the regulations, and maybe other elements aren't strictly necessary. Um, some businesses have closed when arguably they didn't need to in the first place, so um, they're, they're not reopening because of any re relaxation, they're reopening because they've assessed how they do their business and they've concluded that they can, they can open again um, safely. Um, you mentioned the example of, 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 of Matalan, but of course, you know, when we look at, at some of the other businesses that are currently open and allowed to be open, um, I use examples, I suppose, like the big supermarkets and, and possibly some of the big um, DIY stores and so on. They are, of course, also mixed retail. So whilst um, they are have remained open because of their uh, their primary business, um, certainly in regards to supermarkets, as we all know, they pretty much sell most things these days. Um, and, and certainly there have been media reports about uh, the, the main sales from the big hardware stores um, actually not relating to building supplies and hardware, but uh, other things that the shops sell. So there is, a, a, I suppose, a, sort of a business inequity issue there as well about um, you know, why, why you would allow one type of store to open and not another. Some stores, as you will know, have um, partially opened. They, they have, have opened um, part of their store that sells certain items whilst not allowing access to other parts. So um, it is a mixed picture, and I, and I think, um, unfortunately, it's probably likely to get more, more complex before it gets any, any simpler. Um, the final thing about um, outdoor and concerts and things, um, this 
uh, began as a debate about drive-in and church services and whether that was possible or not. And then uh, following on from representations, I mean, uh, there's at least one significant uh, drive-in cinema company in the, in the, in the northwest and uh, potential for um, small theatre companies or concerts, you know, to, to erect stages and, and, and have drive-in events as well. And again, I think the feeling was that in terms of risk, um, they would be no more or less risky potentially than, um, uh, than driving church services. So the decision was taken in policy terms to, to, to broaden that. In terms of the questions about leaving their cars, it does, the amendment does actually say that the uh, organiser must in, uh, ensure um, uh, that the the, uh, the people stay in the cars during the um, during the event uh, or the screening, um, and that they're from the same household. Uh, I accept there's practical issues there about how an organiser might might seek to to ensure that, um, but it was decided to include that in the regulations to make it a legal requirement, so that anybody uh, making such plans would have to then detail how they how they plan to ensure those things. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, we all have to realise that the, the overarching advice still is to stay at home. So, you know, I, I suppose these regulations, when we relax them, uh, there is a wee bit of a, a contradiction creeps into people's minds. But it is the message is still stay at home. And I think we all have to recognise that complacency uh, still remains the, uh, the big enemy. But the, um, if, if whenever we relax one sector, um, I'm getting a lot of phone calls, as I'm sure all the other members are, and people are saying, well, look, if, if that particular sector now you're allowed to do that, why can I not do this? Um, and it has brought forward a, a whole army of barrack room lawyers, people with lots of time in their hands and, and picking through the, uh, through the regulations. But the garden centre one, um, if I uh, drive, say, uh, the closest garden centre to me is six miles away, and I drive to it, uh, but I don't particularly like it, and I prefer the one that's another four miles down the road. So I drive on past that and go to the one that's ten miles away. Uh, am I in breach of the regulations in doing that? Is there any caveat? Or can I go to any garden centre I wish? You know, and I've extrapolated that further. If I can go ten miles instead of six miles, Kind of go 40 mile uh, to a garden centre, and it does start to get a bit ridiculous. But these are the sort of questions that uh, that we are getting uh, thrown at us. And in terms of uh, stores like uh, Madeline, where there is, you know, some, maybe some public concern about uh, that they're trying to find a loophole. Who actually polices that? Is it still the PSNI is the the go-to body to report something like that, or to have it investigated, or is there another uh, investigation body that deals with it? Okay, thank you. Uh, with regard to um, garden centres, uh, there is no restriction in the regulations on travel distance. Obviously, the advice and guidance suggests that people are sensible and not travel any further than they, they need to. So the regulations now um, allow uh, as a reasonable excuse to leave home to go to a garden centre, which uh, again is allowed to be open and to, and to trade. Um, I think what I would say in, in relation to that is, again, focusing on the public health risk. Um, the journey in the car or the travel in the car is, uh, to my mind, um, not where the, where the public health risk lies, you know, whether, whether you're traveling alone or with members of your household in your car for five miles or 10 miles or 15 miles. Um, the risk comes obviously with the activity at the other end um, and when you get out of your car what it is you're actually doing at the other end so the important issue really here is I guess the, the management of the, uh, the garden centre in terms of, of um, uh, the, uh, the, the precautions that are taken there so, so to be clear there's no restriction on, on travel distance um, you, you will probably know I'm sure that um, in, in, in the Republic of Ireland, uh, that there is a, a, a travel distance restriction which was two kilometres and has now been increased to, to five kilometres. Um, uh, but we, we have not imposed um, such, uh, such a travel um, re restriction in terms of um, distance. Um, I think we very much felt, and, and, and the police were inclined to, to agree, that it's um, uh, very, very difficult to actually enforce that. Um, 
In terms of um, businesses, business closures and business restrictions and enforcement, um, the district councils were designated at the same time as uh, SR 82 came in, number two regulations. Uh, councils were, were designated uh, in parallel to those regulations coming in by, uh, by Minister Swan. Um, as an enforcement body under regulations three and four, which is the business closures and restrictions. So whilst the police and the harbour police still have the powers to enforce any of the restrictions in the regulations, the councils are now an additional enforcement body with regard to those business closures. There have been discussions um, in recent days between uh, police, uh, PSNI and uh, councils in terms of how they make best use of the enforcement resources that they have. And it's likely going forward that uh, councils will take the lead um, on any issues around business closures and business restrictions, uh, whilst the police will uh, focus uh, more of their effort in relation to gatherings. And just uh, sorry, just a quick supplementary then. In terms of the councils, um, is there somebody taking a, a, an overview to ensure that uh, all the councils are acting, uh, you know, interpreting uh, regulations in the same way, and that there is? consistency of, of approach by different councils? Um, yes, there are attempts around that. Um, there is a small um, subgroup of uh, Environmental Health Northern Ireland, which is an environmental health subgroup of uh, SOLAS, the chief executives group, that were asked to look at this, um, and they have produced um, some internal guidance for um, enforcement officers, who of course will be relatively new, new to this now, having only recently been designated. Um, and again, there are ongoing discussions about um, how best through that group to deal with their queries and to uh, share experience and information on queries that have been dealt with with, with a view to uh, promoting um, a consistency of approach. Thank you. Thank you. And the final one on this section, to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nigel. It's been very um, useful to have your presentation. Um, just a more generic query. Obviously, these regulations don't cover this, but the most recent uh, development where uh, councils can now open car parks to parks and uh, facilities and whatnot. Um, and I've certainly had a lot of queries around toilet facilities in those areas. And then uh, obviously people then comparing the fact that you, you can um, access a toilet or the toilets are open in a large supermarket, but not at a council facility uh, or a park. I uh, just wondered if you had any comments on that. Yes, thank you. Um, in, in terms of, of the regulations, uh, the first thing to say is that uh, toilets, public toilets, um, have always been listed in the uh, list of types of premises that may remain open. So in terms of the regulations, there is no reason why they need to be closed. Um, toilets, I guess, in terms of um, cleanliness and the potential for transmission of disease uh, pose significant difficulties over and above other types of premises. And I assume that in terms of councils and others, the decision not to uh, open them uh, has been based more around that and the practicalities of putting um, uh, sufficient measures in place um, to ensure the safety both of those potentially using the toilets, but also the staff who have to um, be in and out cleaning and one thing or another. So, so yes, to be to be to be clear, the re regulations um, do not require the toilets to be closed. That that that's clearly an operational decision on the councils. Okay, that's very useful. Thank you. Okay, okay, Nigel, thank you for briefing us there today and for providing those answers. And. Uh, We'll, we'll, give, we'll, we'll move on to considering them now, but we can let you go, Nigel. Thank you for appearing today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for the committee's time. Thanks. Thank yep. Have we been joined by someone else on the phone there? Can I just check? Uh, Pat, are you still on the phone? And checking, is Arlea on the phone? Yes, I'm here, sure. Pat, are you still there on the phone? We may have lost. Yes, I'm still here, sure. Yeah, still there. And have we been just, joined? Uh, sure. Just when you ask, I need you on mute, so just take a second or two, okay? Yep, fair enough. Uh, and Hello, Sharon. Sonia McMullen here from Women's Aid. 
Okay, Sonia. Um, Sonia, we are just still dealing with some of the statutory regulations, and we'd be taking a short break, I think, then, to get people on the phone. So I wonder, would, would it be possible maybe for you to call us back, say, about five past two? Yes, no problem at all. Okay. Talk to you Th Thank you, Sonia. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Okay, members, any, uh, any discussion or anything members want to raise now before we move on to considering each of those? No? Members content? Okay. So I'll now put the question on each one of them in turn. Agenda item 8, SR 2020-82, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions, Amendment No. 2, Regulations 2020. Can I remind members this SR provides for the opening of places of worship for marriage ceremonies for the terminally ill, the reopening of recycling centres and clarification of the application of the enforcement provision with regard to children. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that rule? No. If yes, sir. Sure, sorry, so 82 is the garden centres as well, sir, is it? Uh, no, garden centres is... Yes, it is, Jerry. It's recycling and garden centres, yep. Yeah, sure, I don't know if we... I think we are at the same today, but just to, to put on record, I mean, the other um, changes I have, have no issues with, but I have, so, I have some concerns about the, the garden centres changing. Um, like I said, it, I think it paves the way for, for other places to open. Um, so I'm um, not sure how we register our votes or what here, but I just want to put on record my, my concern about, about that particular aspect of, of the SR. Clark, can you advise what our options are? Um, so the minutes can uh, will reflect the decision taken by the committee, um, unless uh, or, or it'll record a proposal put and then a decision taken uh, in regards to that. Okay, I'll check. Other members um, are other members content with the rule? Uh, yeah. I, I forgot the raise, and I don't know if the, the, the clerk might know the answer to it. Um, is the issue of recycling centre centres? I know that in my area they've opened for. Um, what effectively would go into your black bin or your blue bin only and a lot of people, certainly MLAs in the chamber and, and I think here raised that it was because of fly tipping that we were most concerned and people tend not to fly tip the rubbish that they can put in their bins they tend to fly tip the stuff that they can't put in their bins um, and you know there's been instances in my area where there's fireplaces and lots of wood and cupboards and mattresses and that sort of stuff and actually that there's an element that that's the sort of stuff they want to get to their recycling centers with does anyone know if the, the um, guidelines just say that the recycling centers can open per se or does it say that it can only open for essential waste and does it define it i know it Paddy, I suppose we haven't asked. No, no we should have asked no. it before. But okay, well, Pam. Yeah. Well, obviously, I'm not an authority, but certainly in my area, Antrim Newton Abbey Council have opened their all the recycling. Centers. I'm not sure if they've quite got to like lifting bulky waste type thing, but certainly they're open and they're now open to um, bans and oh, brilliant. as well. So I don't think there's anything to prohibit it. That's what I'm saying. So it's probably down to the individual council. I think the dis sorry, Chair, I think the discretion is really with the individual council to, to set that. That, that's good to know for, for me to go back with, actually. Uh, Ards and North Down Council accepting all waste. It's full, all full facilities, except they're not doing the bulky collections yeah. from homes. But if you want to bring your fireplace up, they'll take it. OK, can I ask then if members are generally content that we... we uh, so, can I ask members to formally agree that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 82, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 2 Regulations NA 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly? Are members agreed? Agreed. Agenda item 9, SR 2020 forward slash 84. The Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3, Regulations 2020. So I remind members this SR provides for private acts of worship, drive in church services, gatherings of up to six people from different households outdoors, and outdoor activities. Have mem members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule? No. Uh, if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 84, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 3, Regulations NA 2020, and 
subject to the examiner of statutory rules reports, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are members agreed? Thank you. Agenda item 10, SR 2020 86, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 4, Regulations NI 2020. Can I remind members that this SR provides for the staging of drive in events such as live concerts, theatre performances, and films? Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No issues. If not, then can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 86, the Health Protection Coronavirus Restrictions Amendment No. 4, Regulations NI 2020, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, recommends that it be confirmed by the Assembly. Are we agreed? Members are agreed. Members, I suggest that we now take a short break to get all our next our panel on the line. So could we suspend the meeting and come back at ten past two sharp? First start. Yep. Thank you. By Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Okay, ta falsha riv arash. We're back now with se section number eleven, and uh, this is in relation to the domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. And this section is a stakeholder briefing. I refer members to tab eleven of your pack and tab eleven of the table papers. Can I remind members that the committee for justice is conducting stage, the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill and has invited the Health Committee to submit any views relevant to our role. I can advise members that stakeholder representatives are here this afternoon to provide the Committee with their views on the health and social care aspects of the Bill. 
So I'd like now to welcome on the phone Ms Sonia McMullen, Regional Services Manager for Women's Aid Federation NI. Sonia, are you there? Yeah, thank you, Sonia. And Mr. Neil Anderson, National Head of Service, NSPCC. Hello, Chair. Yep, welcome, Neil. And Miss Rhonda Lusty from the Men's Advisory Project. Are you there with us, Rhonda? I am indeed. Okay. Okay, I would like to uh, just remind uh, members phoning in from the panel if you have headsets, uh, we find that that's a lot better to use in terms of feedback and uh, clarity. And also, if the members who aren't speaking can keep themselves on mute, that also is helpful for us. And finally, if each of you could just identify who it is when you're speaking, so that we're aware of, of who you are and who you're representing. Um, so we will go ahead now and ask you to please brief the committee. And we'll go maybe in order that we brought you in there, Sonia, then Neil, then Rhonda. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Sonia McMullen. I'm Regional Services Manager, as you have said, from the Federation in Northern Ireland. I'll be representing and speaking on behalf of all of our nine local groups um, this afternoon. So thank you to the Health Committee for giving us the opportunity to address you today in relation to the um, new bill. Sonia, so, to... Sonia, sorry for cutting across. Yep. Can you just speak up yep. a bit there? It's a wee bit hard to hear you. Can you hear me better now? That's much better, yeah. That's much better. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Okay, no problem. Um, Women's Aid have campaigned tirelessly for the last number of years, not only in relation to the introduction of courses and control legislation, but many other aspects. And as you can see for our, from our supporting evidence there as well, um, a lot of that is detailed, and I won't have time to go into all of that um, at the moment. We are concerned, though, that much time has passed, um, and it is useful to look at other jurisdictions and how they have moved on and developed not only in relation to the legal process, but also in relation to good practice. And of course, health and social care is a big part of that. So Women's Aid are really highlighting the omissions from the bill also within the briefing. And what we would like to see for all victims and survivors in Northern Ireland to bring us into line with the rest of the UK. We also want to highlight that there is no funding or resources allocated to the bill. And that's a huge issue for us, um, and I'm sure the other stakeholders say as well. The rule of health care services and early detection and intervention is essential. Victims and survivors have often been subject to years of abuse and have experienced severe trauma associated with long-term health impacts. And almost all victims and survivors of domestic violence and abuse come into contact with health services at some point. And for many women, they are the only safe place to disclose. So health and social care professionals are in a crucial position to identify abuse, intervene early and deliver support um, services. In terms of public health, so domestic violence and abuse is a range of serious physical and mental health consequences for victims, which can be long-lasting, and as well as acute and chronic physical impact, there are strong links to suicide, self-harm and addiction, and we have emphasised that within our supporting evidence around mental health. Half of all people who report domestic violence and abuse have children, and the impact is um, hugely documented as well. So during the domestic abuse bill, we see this as a real opportunity for health and social care to rule out coercive control training to all um, settings, and that's really, really important. Um, you know, by asking key questions routinely and sensitively through the introduction of appropriate screening tools, we really feel that health and social care is a great opportunity here. Domestic violence and abuse doesn't sit with one department. It really requires a coordinated approach across all departments. And I know we're focusing on the domestic abuse bill with um, justice being the, the main you know, department leading on that. But that's why we really welcome the opportunity um, to speak to the health committee today. So with the introduction of the bill, all governance departments really have an opportunity now to move forward and look at discussions about domestic violence and abuse. We have a whole ream of key issues we would love you to consider and address. And on page three of our support and documentation, I don't have time to go into all of that now, but we really would love an opportunity to speak to you about those at another time. As I said, um, we are really concerned about the omissions from the domestic abuse bill. As you know, the, the bill is making its way through Westminster as well, and it is much more robust and inclusive. And we are concerned about the omissions that are outlined in the document. 
first of all, the statutory definition of domestic abuse. Um, in Northern Ireland, our local government has a gender-neutral approach to domestic violence and abuse, and it really does obscure the reality of how abuse is perpetrated. And we really would love, you know, violence against women and girls to be considered. You know, in other jurisdictions, there are violence against women and girls ministers and strategies and departments. Sonia, like Sonia, I'm, yes? I'm sorry for interrupting you. We're losing you a wee bit again there. If you can just give us another bit of yeah. volume. Yeah. Just a wee bit difficult to hear you. Can you hear me now? No. Yes, that's better. I'm up, I'm up the highest I can go. Sorry. <laughs> Volume wise. No, you're good there. If you can stick with that, Is that's that good. all right? Yep, thank you. Okay. So we would, you know, call on a statutory definition, and that isn't included um, in the bill. Also, a domestic abuse commissioner, that's something that we are really going to um, be campaigning for. And, you know, it's essential to scrutinise legislation, policy, practice, and for commission and funding, which is a huge part of the health department's remit in relation to domestic violence services. Um, our justice minister is not convinced at the moment for the need for the com uh, commissioner, but we will continue to campaign for that. And during COVID-19 at the moment, we have really seen how that has been used in England to the benefit. Um, the feedback from organisations is so positive. They had someone to go to to oversee and implement appropriate support services and, of course, access emergency funding during lockdown. And to date, there's been £76 million promised by the Westminster government. And as of today, there's been no offer of emergency funding to support specialised domestic violence and abuse services in Northern Ireland. In relation to um, health and the Department of Health, the reforms of the family court system and child contact are really important. Um, we are, the Westminster government announced a three-month review in 2019, and we would call on you know, a, a total review of our family court system in Northern Ireland with a panel of experts to oversee and um, reduce the continued hardship on children and young people together with their parents. And child contact is another huge issue for us, and the safety of the child contact process is of urgent concern. So we would really benefit from a review in relation to that. There are many other issues that um, we have brought up, and I will let you, you know, look at um, our supporting evidence um, in your own time. Mental health is a huge issue that we have um, many concerns about, and we have named that within our documentation at page 13 around the domestic abuse event. Women's Aid really supports the proposed domestic abuse and family proceedings bill. As I said, we've campaigned for it for a long time, but there is gaps within it, and it could have been a more robust um, document for all victims across Northern Ireland. In relation to the domestic abuse event, we, um, you know, we welcome that. We really do. But there is an awful lot of work to be done. I believe during the, the questions you're going to go through the bill and um, I can name and talk to the particular clauses as and when those questions come up. But I know I only have five minutes, so I'm sure I'm probably over it. So um, I thank you for the opportunity and that will be um, the end of my opening statement. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Sonia. And, um, and, and, and I suppose we do recognise, and I, I think the committee would certainly be receptive to further engagements on this very, very important issue. Um, that certainly will be something that I think would be receptive to. But in terms of uh, informing and focusing our consideration of this bill, um, it would be also important that we deal with the, the, the clauses as well in some detail, or uh, any considerations we need to make in that respect. So I'll now welcome Mr Neil Anderson then. Neil, can you go ahead and give us your briefing? Thank you, Chair. I'll just check the uh, volume is OK for you, So, first of all. Yes, that's good. Neil, yeah. OK. Um, thank you uh, for the opportunity to um, speak to the bill. Um, we, we welcome the bill, first of all, uh, and the opportunity to comment on it. Um, first of all, I'll apologise for not having a written briefing today, but we will have detailed written evidence with the committee for next week. And in the meantime... I'm going to restrict myself to just some brief verbal comments. The first comments I, I make may seem uh, to pick up on technical points, but I, I'm highlighting these because they are relevant, I believe, to the committee and also to the issue of health and social care. And it's a broad concern that the way the bill is currently constructed 
will drive too much towards criminal justice and not enough will be picked up by health and social care and health and social care services. Specifically, what I mean by that is if I use a comparison to the bill which is before Westminster at present, the definition of the domestic abuse offence there has, applies to um, both parties, A and B, being 16 plus. Um, that's not the way it is within uh, the bill that we have before us. So that allows for a much uh, wider age range. In, in our view at NSPCC, we don't believe it is appropriate for children, albeit um, above the age of uh, criminal responsibility, but below the age of 16, to be taken through the criminal justice system. And we do believe that um, uh, a, a more constructive health and social care approach should be taken with those children. And in circumstances where, the, uh, where A is the perpetrator and is committing a domestic abuse offence against B, who is a person under the age of 16 or a child, uh, well then we believe that uh, the existing raft and legislation, which may be introduced in the future, in relation to criminal law and safeguarding and child protection, child protection should be what is, is used and, and utilised in those circumstances. And I just want to point out as well that I think the way the legislation is constructed at this stage, it's causing um, us then to introduce what I consider to be somewhat awkward exceptions. Um, and if you look at the exception in uh, page 7, para 11, the exception where responsibility for children applies, uh, we're having to introduce that because of this um, uh, issue about the age limit. And similarly, um, the exception regarding aggravation Paragraph 17 on page 9 is a rather awkward exception that we're having to introduce because we haven't applied an age limit to where the broader thrust of the legislation applies. Um, NSPCC welcomes the sections on aggravation where the victim is under 18 uh, and also we welcome the section where aggravation where there is a relevant child involved um, and we would ask that in the legislation itself or in related uh, guidance regulations, this is expanded and strengthened upon so that it's recognised that there are two victims in these circumstances, that B may be the victim directly of the domestic abuse, but there is also uh, C who is a victim of child abuse and emotional neglect. More broadly, uh, on the issue of health and social care services, and I'm not going to go into this up to a lot of detail, I would refer the committee broadly to part four of the domestic abuse bill, which is before Westminster. Um, part four is the section which deals with uh, responsibilities placed on local authorities. And I suppose I would comment then in relation to the bill that we have before us, that it's largely silent on responsibilities and duties and the role of health and social care. So my appeal is to uh, refer the committee to the detail that is in the bill before Westminster, understanding that Northern Ireland is of a different scale and therefore not everything in that may necessarily apply, but it certainly provides some guidance. Uh, there would be a debate to be had about where statutory duties and responsibilities would sit within Northern Ireland. Uh, it could be with the Health and Social Care Trust, with the Health and Social Care Board. Uh, th that debate is something that can be resolved locally, but we do believe it would be important to have a statutory duty for the delivery and um, the support that is provided, the delivery of services and support that is provided to victims of domestic abuse. And I'm just going to finish my opening comments there, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, Neil. And we'll uh, finish in terms of presentations then with yourself, Rhonda. Uh, could you go ahead there on behalf of Men's Advisory Project, please? I can indeed. How's the sound? Can you hear me? We can. Yeah, just, just, just about. If you can get any more volume, that would be great. But we can hear you there, I think, okay. I think that's about as good as I am. I think I've turned up as I can go. Okay. Um, so... Um, I would thank you for the opportunity to comment. Um, my name is Rhonda Lofty and I'm the coordinator of the Men's Advisory Project. Um, we welcome the introduction of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceeding Bill to the Assembly and the opportunity to provide comment to, uh, and scrutiny of the bill to the Health Committee. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, the Men's Advisory Project is a regional charity specialising in the support for men and children enduring abuse working to end domestic abuse. 
Um, over the past 21 years, we have been at the forefront of shaping services to men who have been suffering domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. At heart, we are a special service for male survivors of domestic abuse and their children. We have been very concerned that no funding and resources have been allocated to the bill as it currently stands. And we would mirror this comment from Women's Aid. Sorry, we've gone after Sonia. Um, we are worried that this will be an indication of how well we will be able to address the needs of victims and survivors as we widen the scope of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. These are great opportunities for change for health and social care, but we must make a decision to do so. We can and could leave the UK, but it is vital that we commission services to address the needs of all victims. As I'm sure you're aware, police service statistics show that in the 12 months from the 1st of January 2019 to the 31st of December 2019, there were 31,705 domestic abuse incidents um, and 18, just over 18,000 domestic abuse crimes. One third of those domestic abuse crimes happened to men. Behind every single one of those figures, lives are, are destroyed and families are torn apart. But what we don't see is the other side of this abuse, which is the coercive control element, this insidious element which is at the heart of all of this abuse. So whilst there's been an increase in reporting, domestic abuse is still underreported. And we can see that from the evidence of the crime survey for England and Wales, which would suggest that only 21% of people who report being a victim of partner abuse would report this to the police. So our statistics, whilst shocking, only show a tiny snapshot of what's really going on. The Men's Advisory Project support any man who requires help for having endured domestic abuse. And we, we welcome and support men of any age, sexuality or walk of life, whether that is rural or urban, and pay close attention to any additional vulnerability that they may present with. We must ask that we widen the lens that we view domestic abuse through. We must now pay attention to those who have long been ignored and those abused in ways that are often unseen but dramatically experienced. This must mean that we pay attention to those men who total one-third of domestic abuse crime stats. We say domestic abuse is everyone's business, but for this to be the case, we must include everybody when we consider screening for or providing services to them. There can be no hierarchy of victims or hierarchy of delivery of services to victims, to their children or to access to their children. So we welcome the opportunity to speak and we have many things to say when you ask us questions. And we really apologise for not being able to put forward a written response, but given, our, given the timings, this is impossible, but we're happy to do so afterwards. Okay, thank you, panel. And, and we'll now go to uh, questions from members. And I suppose I should declare a, a, a conflict or an interest in that I have worked as a social worker and I have witnessed at first hand both the, the complexity and the prevalence of domestic violence in terms of uh, what is referred to as the toxic trio and the impact that it has on, on many lives and, in, and, and has blighted and continues to blight many lives. Um, so I suppose my question would be in relation to a particular clause within the, within the bill provides for exceptions where a course of behaviour may be reasonable, such as where interventions by a partner may be necessary in cases of mental illness or addiction. In your experience, do you have, do you have any thoughts on that particular clause? If I could come in there first, I, I didn't refer to it in my initial comments, but it was one of the ones that I had noted that from a children's perspective, I do have concerns about that clause um, and how tightly defined that would have to be to make sure that um, reasonable behaviour doesn't become loosely defined as things which um, annoy or antagonise someone who um, commits domestic abuse against a child or young person. So either in the legislation itself or in related regulations or guidance, I, I would be urging much tighter elaboration and definition of, of what is intended by that exception. Okay, thank I'm you. Sonia from Women's Aid here. Um, we would have um, concerns as well that um, there is a need for a course for a safeguard in order to protect family members, but um, it shouldn't come at the expense of the bill. 
having no teeth in a defendant pleading reasonableness. Um, I think, you know, especially if the victim has mental health issues, you know, caused by the abuse. And I think that has been, you know, raised by the Justice Committee um, at the, you know, debating stage. Um, so I think it is a concern. Okay, thank you. And um, Rhonda, have you anything in relation to that? Yeah, in our view, a subjective test of intention would be problematic. So, by and large, we agree with the objective reasonable person test um, because a subjective test of intention would be impossible standard to prove in court. Recklessness and reasonableness would be a sufficient standard test to meet in order for the law to apply. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have at this stage two indications in the room, and then I'll go to the phone. So I have, uh, first of all, Deputy Chair Pam Cameron, and then I'm going to Paula, and then I'll come across to the phones. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, panel, for your uh, attendance here at the committee today. Uh, I suppose, in, just in relation to what we all welcome, obviously, the introduction of this legislation, and we know it's very much long overdue. Uh, but in relation to the comments around, uh, Neil, you uh, made a comment about the age limits. And I'm just wondering whether uh, Rhonda and Sonia, you have any commentary or thoughts around the age limit issue in the bill? Um, thank you. Um, is that in relation to Sonia here? Sorry. In relation to the um, both being young person um, of 16 plus, that they can both um, be party. As Neil had um, commented, is that what you're talking about then? Yes, um, yes. With regard to that, yeah, I think it, um, you know, has as Neil has commented, um, the bill needs to be pulled out a little bit more with regard to um, quite a lot of the regulations and things that would come. So I think um, the Department of Justice would have to um, consider that. There's lots of other things within the bill that may have to be, um, you know come up for much more debate. We welcome the you know, the recognition of course that there's more young people where domestic violence and abuse is becoming, you know, fundamental part of a teen relationship. So we welcome that acknowledgement. But of course it has to um, you know, we have to have more detail basically in relation to it because it is very vague at the moment. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Rhonda here. I think it's, I think it's difficult in that um, there are some questions of whether or not a child sh should be defined as someone under 18 in line with uh, UNCRC standards, but I guess um, it's, it's very, very difficult because of course we know that between the age of 16 and 18 quite a lot goes on and we would want always to have things as protective and as wide as possible, but also not to legislate where other legislation is in place. So it's definitely something that will need to be debated further, and I think that that was something that we um, had placed forward in our initial submissions. Okay, thank you. And um, then just on uh, Sonia, you made a comment about um, a campaign to have a, a domestic abuse commissioner. Um, do either Neil or um, Rhonda have views on that, whether they agree with that or are calling for same or not? The, um, I'll go first there. The uh, Domestic Abuse Commissioner is uh, referred to in this section, part four of the legislation before Westminster on domestic abuse. Um, that's not quite the same as saying whether I support that or not. I did make the comment that if we have to, we have to assess in our view in Northern Ireland about the scale and need here. So I suppose I'm um, I'm neutral on that point at the minute. Um, I, I would I would certainly wish there to be more debate of that, uh, and certainly could be persuaded that it was necessary. But um, I'm I'm open-minded on that as yet. But it is part of part four of the legislation before Westminster. Sonia here again. I suppose the Domestic Abuse Commissioner has been in place, you know, now from September in England and Wales, and we can see just how well that has worked. Also in Northern Ireland, you know, we have a Victims Commissioner, but it's only for troubles related crimes as well. So Dame Vera Beard would be the Victims Commissioner um, in England as well, and she's a great champion for domestic violence and abuse. So we are very much, you know, minded that um, we would like the Justice Minister to 
really take that into consideration. I know there there is a, a lot of money, you know, to open an office and everything, but I think it really does need to come out for further debate. Thank you. Um, I think it's well done, Musty. Um, I think when the Justice Minister was speaking about it costing around a million pounds, I think that was one of the things which was off put in. Um, it, but however, the price, it, it depends if we can look at whether the price is weighed up against the gain. And what we've seen is we have a children's commissioner, we have a victim's commissioner, and yet we don't have a commissioner for domestic abuse. Perhaps if we had had a, vic a commissioner for domestic abuse, some of the funding from UK government to um, Northern Ireland might have been um, during COVID might actually have been given to domestic abuse charities. So there is something to be said, and I can see the negatives and positives. So I think it is something that should be looked at further. I guess I would be with Neil in this, but I certainly think that we do need some point of focus as to how we move forward with domestic abuse. Thank you, panel. I'm going now to Paula. Thank you, and thank you, panel, for coming today and giving your evidence. Um, I'm, con I'm caught curious as to how you, you think that this bill could deal with um, false allegations of domestic abuse. I had a constituent at the weekend who went to pick up his children and was told if he didn't leave, he would, she would slap a non-molestation order on him and tell the police that he'd been violent with her. Um, how, how do we make sure that this legislation is robust enough to make sure that we get people who are domestic abusers and that people can't use it then to alienate their children? Thank you. Can I answer? Yeah, go ahead. Who's it's, that? It's, it's Rhonda. Yes, sir. Rhonda. Go ahead. Um, a large number of the men that we see um, would stay in domestically abusive relationships because of the threats made to them around um, the children and what will happen to them regarding false allegations, which will um, not only harm their ability to parent and have a relationship with their parents, but might harm their reputation, you know, all sorts of different things along those lines. So we, we would see that a vast amount within the Men's Advisory Project, and we would see that reported by victims um, you know, all the time, and I, do, I really truly do mean all the time. So often we see men who stay in abusive relationships until their children are post the age of 18, purely for the reason of fear of false allegations or of being prevented from seeing their children. Um, the one thing that was very positive about the um, legislation was the idea of um, a child being used to abuse another, and we would hope that there's something within the scope of the legislation which will prevent that from happening. But in terms of false allegations, it's really about how we start to look at allegations and how we start to widen our lens in our understanding of really having a look at what's going on, asking questions in a different way, and starting to view domestic abuse that it can be perpetrated by anyone and it can be experienced by anyone. Okay, just a second question here. For Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Sonia. Um, Thank you. Um, in relation to the false allegations, I know, of course, there will be some false allegations in any kind of um, case that would come up. But as someone who has worked in one day for almost 25 years in this sector and has supported many, many women, the impact, the damage, the ongoing trauma um, that happens, you know, Many you know, women that we deal with, they want contact to happen, but they want safe contact to happen. Um, that's why, in relation to health and social care, and um, Chair, you talked about being a social worker, so you will know the high level of cases that there are within our family and child care system where there is domestic violence present. So it's so important that our new social workers going out there are very well trained in relation to the designs and effects of domestic violence and abuse especially in relation to coercive um, control. There's ongoing abuse that happens during child contact that we come and deal with all the time. So the whole, that's why we are calling for a review, which is uh, already happening in England from the domestic abuse bill that we keep referring to as good practice. So we really think that a whole review 
of our family courts and child contact as a whole would be essential um, moving forward for, for all of these issues to support all victims of um, domestic violence and abuse. Thank you. Um, I'll just add that I agree with the comments of my colleagues. Um, false allegations um, of any sort, are, um, particularly in this area, um, domestic and sexual violence, are devastating um, to the person who is, is the victim of that false allegation. At the same time, though, I think it is very, very difficult to try and deal with that in the technicalities of the legislation. Uh, I believe it is probably more to fall into the domain of the ongoing development of the professionalism and the wonderful work that our social workers do in the quality of the assessments that they make and also in the um, increased professionalisation and approach and sensitivity of the police in their investigations. Thank you. I would certainly concur with, with those points. Uh, the second um, question really is in relation to that term gaslighting. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on how like psychological and emotional abuse can be demonstrated robustly that would stand up in, in a court. Thank you. Which of the panel wishes to pick up on that question? Um, it's Connie McMullen here from Woman Jade again. I suppose um, we can um, look again to other jurisdictions um, with regard to best practice. And there have been many cases of prosecution where coercive control, you know, um, has a charge has been given and come to court. Um, and I think we need to look at that. And again, it comes back to no resources being attached to the bill. Uh, in relation to our police service, that would be um, a huge part of this for their training in relation to being able to produce really good evidence, you know, from the body-worn cameras, looking at the questions and the things that they ask whenever they do attend a domestic violence incident, and being able to um, use that um, with regard to joining up with the PPS to look at their gathering of evidence and a review of that to be able to um, produce better evidence for the court in relation to um, the signs and symptoms of courses controlling and um, psychological, you know, damage that happens in relation to this particular crime. Um, hi, may I answer? So it's um, Rhonda Lusty. Um I think this, I would agree with Sonia that um, one of the real issues in and around this, and in and around false allegations as well, is how we fund this. So when we start to look at how we would get a clear and coherent account from a victim that's reliant upon powers of recall and concentration. Their cognition of events and, and their ability com to communicate may be impaired. So if you were to try and speak to someone who has had a false allegation made against them, that person may be um, you know, unable really to put their case forward properly. So we must spend time thinking about how we can thoughtfully and gently get the best answers and the best work from these people. We have to look at how we overcome barriers of communication, including language barriers and other impairments. Um, and we must look about how we can build a case in which we can show um, that this behaviour has been over a period of time, how others have witnessed it, how um, self-blame can be seen as, as not necessarily um, an, an admittance of, of mal intent or mal behaviour, but sometimes can actually be something that a victim views and sees as they have been a victim, of course, of control over a long, longer period. This is a difficult set piece of work. And as Neil said earlier, it, it requires intensive training of all our first responders and it requires time, and it will, will require money. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I should have said I am Naomi's APS and Department of Justice. Okay. Thank you. And moving, oh, I'm going to go to the phones then, and I'll check with Orlea first. Orlea, are you there on the phone? I am. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, some of the points that Sonia had made in in her presentation um, around the mental health concerns um, with this issue and that the bill could have um, been more robust um, to deal with some of those concerns. And I was just wondering, does Sonia or do, do any of the panel 
what would be, is there any, you know, practical steps or initiatives that, um, that could improve this bill in the context of mental health? Um, and, I mean, the points were made um, by all the speakers so far just about that, you know, trying to get more of a coordinated approach, and that is so, so important. And thank you for coming to the Health Committee today with us, um, because obviously we do have the Protect Life 2 strategy where um, the domestic... Um, Violence, it, it, it comes under um, one of the vulnerable groups. But, I mean, there also is opportunities um, coming up with the 10-year mental health strategy. Um, although um, you haven't been able to get the, the um, domestic violence commissioner, we need to look at, can there be a role here for the mental health champion to help with your campaigns and to help reflect that in, in any of the strategies that are coming up? Um, and then even with, you know, the, the, with young children, um, living in, in the home where there's domestic violence and the impact that that has then on the whole um, adverse childhood experiences, then what role and what is the Department of Education, you know, bring into this issue as well. So it was just maybe to get your thoughts of if there is any practical things that we could try and influence um, uh, from a health committee perspective when we're discussing the bill. And if that's not doable, how can we influence future strategies that are coming that are coming through because the domestic violence and the mental health and the physical health, it's all intertwined. So thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And can we go across the panel then, please? Sonia, if you're coming in there, your volume has dropped away on us again a bit, so if you can just keep aware of that. Okay, Yeah, just... Hello? Yeah, can you, can that's, you hear me? Okay. You, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. The links to mental health um, are huge, you know, and in the UK it's estimated that one in eight of all suicides and suicide attempts by women are due to domestic violence and abuse. And as you've mentioned, you know, the Protect Life 2 strategy, it does acknowledge there's certain risk factors and people who are vulnerable to um, suicide would be those who have experienced abuse. Um, domestic violence and sexual violence. So I suppose it's something that, that isn't discussed in terms of suicide um, in Northern Ireland and we would, would like to bring it to the fore. And I totally agree, any new strategies that are coming out in relation to the Department of Health, it's about naming it. It's about early intervention and prevention and in relation to the health and social care, you have so many opportunities there with health and social care providers. As I said at the start um, of my opening statement, so many people come into contact, whether it could be a physiotherapist or radiographer, a health visitor. You know, there's so many people that have those opportunities. And with the course of control legislation, you know, the money and the resources have to be there. And as Rhonda has rightly said, it's those first responders. It's so important that people get that right response within those first few minutes and that first few minutes of disclosure. And it can change um, a lifetime, you know, um, to be acknowledged, to be believed, to be accepted, and to know where to sign post and refer on to. So I think there's a lot of work ongoing, and um, Women's Aid and the whole sector in relation to all the organisations working with domestic violence and abuse, you know, we would all want to be part of that and, and be more part of the mental health discussion um, as a whole, which we probably haven't been um, to date. In relation to children, of course, we have the adverse childhood experiences and um, domestic violence and abuse being one of them. Um, Women's Aid has a 10 year strategy in relation to our work with um, children and young people. We also have our Help Enhance project, um, and that is now into year 11 um, of funding with the Department of Education. And it is so important, as I said from the outset, that all of the government departments join up and have a joint up um, together, you know, response in relation to domestic violence and abuse. And we'll be able to um, move forward um, in relation to this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, going across then to Pat. Uh, Pat, can I check if you're there on the phone for a question? I have no questions, uh, Chair. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So I'm Chair. Calling... Yep. Uh, Chair, I'm so sorry. Um, would you mind if I spoke a little bit to um, um, just what Sonia has said? Yes, go ahead, Rhonda. Rhonda, just before, um, you, before you speak, Rhonda, it's not too bad at the minute, but when you're speaking, sometimes there's a bit of feedback. I'm not sure, but you, you seem to be OK at the minute. But go ahead there, Rhonda, please. Is that better? Yeah, that seems OK. Yeah. OK. So 
what we would see, and I think we would see this across the board, is that, um, and I mean across the board as in anyone who deals with victims, you know, um, quite often we're asked to speak separately, but we work together to try and um, alleviate abuse of children, women and men. So, you know, we often see this. More than 70% of the men that we would see are taking medication for depression and anxiety. And many of those men have been on that medication for longer than 10 years. Over 25% of the men that we see in services have attempted suicide at some point. 74% of suicide in Northern Ireland happens to men. And these are things that we ne never really add together when we start to think about how we are going to deliver services. When we start to have a look at um, indicators of poor health and how men access health, we also have to look at when we look at first responders, whether it's a dental appointment or physio appointment or what it is, that these people also consider widening their lens. I keep saying this widening the lens so that they view the person that's sitting in front of them, if it's a man, as also a victim of domestic abuse, whether they're older, younger, disabled, whether they're um, men who have sex with men, it doesn't matter who they are, that that first response, they are also considered to be potential victims of domestic abuse. This is so vitally important because these controlling behaviours erode a victim's sense of self-worth worth and self-esteem. And so we see all manner of different mental health responses from there. So we'll see PTSD, we'll see anxiety, we'll see depression, you know, and, and we'll see alcohol abuse, we'll see drug abuse, we'll see all sorts of maladaptive coping behaviours. This absolutely has to be something that we work together in terms of mental and physical health. And it has to be something that's widened out so that everyone who is assessed is assessed in the same way. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, Neil, do you want to say anything on that before I move on? I'm not going to have anything to add to what my colleagues have said. I'm happy for you to move on, Chair. Thank you, Neil. Um, going then to uh, yeah, back to the back to Alex, please. Yeah. Thank Alex. You. Um, thank you for your presentation so far, and I have to say I welcome this bill very much. Um, and some of the questions I have are. In terms of sentencing um, for offences, have you any idea what type of level of sentencing you'd like to see? The first question. Yeah, over to panel, please. Who wants to lead off on that one? <laughs> um, I'll I'll start, Chair, just by um, admitting that I, I don't have in mind. Um, a certain number of years in, in terms of, of sentencing. Uh, I do believe that uh, these are among the most serious uh, offences within our society and, and the, the penalty has to represent that. But for me, I leave that to those who develop the sentencing guides and, and the judges. But in addition to that, I will add, I'm very pleased to see within this the um, aggravation factors. So the aggravation that can be applied in sentencing where the victim is under 18 and also the aggravation where a relevant child is involved. Um, I, I did comment on this briefly earlier, I'll just try to explain a little bit again here that I feel a little bit, although I've welcomed those, I feel a little bit that the, um, the way in which the young person or child is represented is a little bit passive, as if they're a bystander or, or observer to the domestic abuse. I made the point earlier that I think there are actually two victims, uh, that the sentencing should uh, sentencing in relation to aggravation should reflect that and it should be severe as well. Okay, thank you, Neil. Any other uh, contributions from the panel on that subject? Yeah, it's funny here from one of the um, We welcome the range of sentences available now, looking at um, Clause 14, and the maximum penalty will be in the Magistrates' Court 12 months and then 14 years in the Crown Court. And there may also be a fine or both um, at each court here. So we do welcome the extension and it is higher than is what is available um, through the Domestic Abuse Bill in England, I believe, at the moment. So, um, we do welcome that and also, um, as Neil has said, the aggravation where a child um, under 18, you know, um, these years or is present. Um, we do welcome that because children have to be 
acknowledge there's equal victim care in relation to domestic violence and abuse, and that's really important, and it is something that's referenced within our 10-year strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Hi. Yeah, Rhonda, go ahead. Hi, Rhonda here. I agree entirely with what my colleagues say, but in addition, we welcome the aggravator of domestic abuse with other crimes. So if there's criminal damage, but it's done within a domestically abusive scenario, that, that, that can be looked at differently and is seen as an aggravator. Because quite often those aspects of criminal damage are, of course, used to cause fear, to keep coercive control, to keep people in that space. And so the acknowledgement of that is vitally important. We do, of course, see children as victims of abuse. We certainly do not um, agree in any way that they're bystanders. So if we can highlight that at every level, we will. And we're really, really glad to hear our, And we know that our colleagues will do the same. So we're really pleased to see that. Thank you. Rhonda, Alex? OK, um, my other question is... Um, I can um, stand to be corrected, but I dread in our notes that um, tendencies for victims of domestic abuse aren't in the bill. Um, if that's correct, do you feel that it should be in the bill? And can we look at maybe including it in the bill? Because I think it's very important that, especially with women and, and children that are abused, that they have a, a safe environment to go to. And I know there's just the women's aid and things like that, but. Um, Depending on the situation, that's not always uh, suitable. So, I would like to see that in the bill, if possible, and I wonder what the panel think about that being included or not. Yep. To Alex, sorry, it's Sonia McMullen here from Women's Aid. You cut out at the start, so I wasn't. Um, I couldn't hear what you said. What you would want included in the bill? Um, there was a bit I read on, on our briefing notes that in the bill. Um, secure tenancies for victims of domestic abuse wasn't including in our bill, but it was was in the yeah. England and Scotland. I think. Um, how do you feel about that being included? Because I I feel it's very important that it is included, and I'm a bit disappointed it's actually not in the bill, unless I've got that wrong. Yep, um, I can take that. It's on here again um, in the first instance. If that's okay. Um, housing is a major concern. You know, um, domestic violence causes homelessness. In relation to the secure tenancy, the Department of Communities did contact us um, whenever the domestic abuse bill was discussed as going through Westminster to say that they could not um, take on secure tenancies in relation to Northern Ireland, the way our housing system works. So there is a new policy development within Northern Ireland at the moment, which would not sit with that either through the Department of um, communities and the housing executive. So in relation to um, housing at the moment, there's a, a new system coming into place in relation to um, the point system and everything and private landlords and it's all quite um, technical. But we have um, major issues with regard to that. We do think that everyone who is a, um, a victim of domestic violence should be able to um, be allowed to have emergency provision for housing and that's so important because it is such a, a factor in people not leaving relationships not go and um, not speak in support. In relation to Northern Ireland, the Department of Communities has said have a new um, I'm just trying to they have a new um, policy that is coming out but the domestic abuse and family proceedings still here in Northern Ireland does omit the mention of housing completely. And it is very much a justice-led bill compared to the domestic abuse bill, which is going through Westminster, which does have more focus on um, the family court, for example, not just the criminal court, housing and health and social care as well. But it's really, really difficult. The legislation in England and Wales, it clearly mentions housing and the government's duty pertaining to victims of domestic abuse. So we would have welcomed that coming into our own legislation. We understand that it does lie very much outside of the remit of Department of Health, um, but thank you so much for raising it. But we do think that domestic abuse cuts um, are a real concern. You know, our supporting people um, at the moment um, hasn't been ring-fenced who would... Um, um, they, 
pay for all of our refuges, obviously. So, it, you know, in other jurisdictions of the UK, there is ring fence funding for refuge and secure tenancies for social housing. But we accept Northern Ireland is a different jurisdiction with different laws. But we do need to address this because um, housing is a huge, a huge issue. And I'm sure, you know, my um, colleagues would um, agree on that in relation to um, the amount of homelessness. You know, our refuges are constantly sitting at almost 100% occupancy. And home is not a safe place all of the time. We always need emergency provision for housing for women, children and young people. Thank you. I, uh, I share your view that the, the bill that we have before us is largely silent on um, issues such as housing or any services or care um, or duties. And um, again, uh, as, as colleagues have referred to and I referred to earlier myself, comparisons to um, legislation in different jurisdictions can be made and there's much more detail in them about duties and who those duties sit with and responsibilities to provide services. And um, I do think albeit acknowledging that Northern Ireland is a different jurisdiction, different size and scale, resources are an issue, I think the bill would benefit from a section which attempted to address some of those points. Um, Thank you, Neil. Yes, Bonda Lusty from the Men's Advisory Project. I was so glad to hear my colleague Sonia speak about uh, secure housing for any victim of domestic abuse, as she always does, in fact. But as you're aware, there are no refuge spaces for male victims uh, of domestic abuse in Northern Ireland. Um, and this has always been somewhat of an issue. As we move forward and try to address this in a better way with um, the Department of Communities, um, we hope to address this problem. But if you can imagine being a man in a domestically abusive relationship, and the things, that, the insidious things that are being said to you, which are saying that you will be homeless, that you won't have your children, that these things, and then when it comes to it, actually that does seem to be the case. We don't have the, the brilliant system of support that Women's Aid um, have and, and have worked hard to provide for female victims of domestic abuse and their children. If you're a man, you and your children um, there isn't a refuge to go to. There isn't that floating support that can give you support daily to help you with your needs, which is so vital um, to help you move through what's just happened to you and to help look after you and your children whilst you access support. So these are things which absolutely must be considered and again must, must be considered in a wider way so that we help all victims of domestic abuse, including those, those third which are men. Thank you, panel. I'm um, going across now to Jerry. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentation. I mean, obviously, the figures of domestic violence increasing by a tenth and at least three deaths in, in the in the midst of the coronavirus crisis should sadly remain this way. We do need um, legislation around this. Um, can I ask a couple of questions? Um, am I right in saying um, the bill proposes non-jury um, in all cases? Um, and, and if that is the case, I mean, obviously there will be a rationale in terms of protecting um, people, victims and survivors. Um, they obviously need to be central to, to this uh, legislation. But um, if it is the case, then it, it would maybe leave a, um, a loophole or a sort of a problem in the fact that it, it would assume that judges always get um, illegal cases correct. Um, so a, a comment on that. Um, um, the other point about... And the domestic abuse commissioner. Am I correct in saying the minister uh, isn't for it or is uh, is unconvinced of it? Uh, and if that's the case, uh, why do you think? Um, why do you think? What is the argument against a commissioner and the argument for a commissioner? Uh, and then, kind of quickly come back with another question. Thanks. Go go ahead, panel, please, and then go ahead, panel. Okay, it's Sonia here from um, Mon and Jade. In relation to um, the judges always getting it right, um, I suppose we were coming back to the whole training and rollout for all regal, legal professionals, including the judiciary, in relation to domestic violence and abuse. So we welcome the domestic violence um, listings, you know, the court pilot that um, was in foil, and we believe that there will be another um, domestic violence specialised court that will be piloted in Belfast after COVID 
and that's where we need to go with this, where you have specialised um, judiciary um, prosecutors, etc., that really will um, be able to um, know. So, you know, you're, you're, you're dropping, you're dropping oh, away from us there, Sonia? In relation to um, domestic violence. So, in relation to the domestic violence commissioner, um, the justice minister really was. Um, She's quoted as saying that given the very close and constructive working relationships with key statutory and voluntary sector partners um, and that we only have one police service covering our entire jurisdiction, um, she found it unclear as to what um, a commissioner could bring. And then it was quoted that the office is going to cost £1 million. Pounds. I suppose for us in Northern Ireland, we really think we need an accountable mechanism for scrutinising legislation, policy, practice, commission, funding and provision of services. And as I said previously, in relation to the COVID situation, we can see the benefit for anybody who maybe was sitting in the fence. They can really see now, um, for colleagues in England, they had someone to go to. And that domestic abuse commissioner, as Rhonda had mentioned, really helped them get and source that £76 million. And as I said, at the moment, we have had no offer of emergency funding for any specialised services in Northern Ireland. So I really think it would provide public leadership to have that space. You know, Kula Yusuma, everybody knows our Children's Commissioner, very high profile, and is there and is the champion for children and young people in Northern Ireland. And I really feel that we need a champion for domestic violence and abuse. You know, it's 16% of all crimes in Northern Ireland and as Rhonda said, it's one of the most underreported crimes. There's a huge amount of people. And we know during COVID and during lockdown that there's going to be a huge increase in sore whenever people are allowed to get out and, and get support and find those pathways to support. So it would be a key role, especially in the implementation of our domestic um, homicide reviews, for example, and overseeing compliance with the Specialist Domestic Violence Court. Course of control training at the moment and looking at the PSNI and all the legal professionals, you know, going back into the last question around training, around the judiciary and everything. A lot of these, there's no accountability at the moment. We have great relationships with our Department of Justice and Department of Health and, you know, our funders. And um, we always have and they're always open um, to listen to us and we welcome that. But we really do think that this could be um, something that could be a real game changer in relation to um, the whole sector. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel on that? Uh, I was just going to about how cases are handled um, through courts and, and hearings. I think a thing that is always going to drive um, the proceedings in these types of cases is the impact on the people involved um, in the cases, particularly the, uh, the victims and witnesses because uh, we have to be careful that we don't re-traumatise them through the whole process of court proceedings. So I think it's inevitable that we're, that we're always going to be trying to protect them in terms of how evidence is given, how they're cross-examined, how they're dealt with in the courts. I absolutely agree that the um, uh, judges aren't infallible. Um, but I also agree that uh, I think the answer there may be in specialism and more and more training there so that we get more and more right. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the commissioner, um, I'm not against it. Uh, I, I simply said that I, uh, uh, I believe it was something that's maybe more, I would like there to be more debate and that I would like more clarity around um, the, the role and purpose of it here in the context of Northern Ireland, the funding required, etc. But I'm, I'm not against it. I'm open-minded. Thank you. Um, um, Rhonda, yeah? Sorry, finally me again. Um, I think with regard, um, one of the things we were really happy to see was how people would or would not be able to cross-examine um, during court proceedings. Um, we were pleased to see some of the things uh, Lord Justice Gillen had brought forward and had spoken about in how special measures really can be used and should be used in circumstances where witnesses can be considered to be vulnerable. And we were also pleased to see that there would be a parity of arms so that if um, so that if there was someone who was accused um, of domestic abuse, that they would have legal representation given to them. Um, so we were um, we we were heartened to see those two areas. We we are and have been confused about for a long time about um, 
abuse of the system in terms of the legal system and, and abuse of how the system works in terms of legal aid and things like that. And we're not quite sure that the bill addresses that, but nor are we quite sure that that's the right place for, for, the, for this to be addressed in the bill. Um, so but we have been really pleased with that. Again, with the victim commissioner, um, I think Sonia quoted directly from what uh, uh, Minister Long said, so we, you know, we're in full agreement with that. Um, and we would like, again with Neil, we would just like further discussion to see where we can go. I think there's something so vitally important to draw attention to something that maybe a domestic abuse commissioner would draw that attention to this being illegal and abuse not being, you know, there, there being no excuse for domestic abuse, whether it's psychological or physical. Thank you. Jay, I will come back to you for a third question if you get the opportunity. And if other members want to consider if there's any other quick questions, we may have time. But I'll go now to Alan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, domestic abuse, it's, it's not only a horrible crime, but it's a cowardly crime. And it's probably been around for hundreds of years. And it's only in recent years that uh, society has felt able to speak about it uh, for what it is. And even in the not too distant past, the, the police struggled with how best to deal with the issue. And the biggest obstacle uh, to achieve in prosecution was the reluctance of victims to make a formal complaint or to follow through and stand in a witness box to prove a case against the abuser. And I know that took a lot of courage. Uh, are victims of abuse still reluctant to speak out, or are they more empowered now uh, and feel sufficiently protected uh, to follow through and, and do cases still occasionally collapse because the victim uh, maybe refuses to give evidence or withdraws their evidence? And also, are there still victims out there who will tolerate abuse uh, for fear of their family being broken up? Thank you, Alan. And to go across to the panel then for that. Okay, it's um, Sonia here from Women's Aid. Um, thank you, Alan. I'm very, very um, good question, bringing up an awful lot of key issues. Are domestic cases drop charges in relation to domestic violence cases? There's a number of... Um, Sorry, Sonia, I'm, I'm struggling oh. to hear you there. If you can just speak okay. up a little. Can you hear me now? Yes. That's better, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Alan. Okay. So there are a number of um, issues, um, including the delays in court. Um, it can take an awful long time for cases to come through. There can be an awful lot of intimidation by family members. And indeed, as Alan has rightly said, um, you know, there can be um, intimidation by family and worry, you know, in relation to what that could mean for your family and a breakup of the family, of course. There are many people who still do live um, in situations where there is domestic violence. And, you know, I've supported women over the years who have been in relationships, you know, and they're in their 70s and 80s that are coming to Women's Day and they're very, very sad you know, when they have aged really through domestic violence. But this is an issue. We've done an awful lot of work with the Public Prosecution Service over the years and have done training with their, their specialised prosecutors in relation to both domestic and sexual violence um, because it is such an issue around people dropping, um, dropping um, charges. So I think if we look at some good practice across the rest of the UK in relation to, for example, it was which are independent domestic violence advocates. We don't have them in Northern Ireland. And there is a body of research that does show that more people will go through that court process if they have an independent advocate. It was also one of the recommendations in um, Sir, John, Sir John Gillen's reviews in relation to um, sexual violence cases as well. And that is really something that is needed. It's about communication. It's about being believed. It's about achieving, you know, the achieving best evidence, um, your um, statement that it's done in such a way that is supportive. And it's about making this whole process more supportive, that people don't feel they're being re-traumatised whenever they go into a courtroom. And, and that's where you know, we have to work so hard. And there's a lot of the recommendations in the Gillen Review that certainly apply to domestic violence and abuse cases, and we really would welcome um, you know, that to be taken into consideration. And as Rhonda has already mentioned, special measures as well should be available through all the court settings, including family proceedings. And very often at the moment, people will turn up for court and special measures aren't in place and they have been requested and they have been promised. 
So we have to look at video link evidence as well. Can we do more of that and have a more supportive environment? Because this person comes to court and they think they are, I suppose, in the criminal setting, you know, that the public prosecution service is there to support them. But, you know, they're just a witness in a case. So really, you know, the the alleged perpetrator has someone there to support them and guide them the whole way through. But the person who is the um, complainant doesn't have that support. So I think that advocate role is key, absolutely, um, to to really looking at um, having extra support available for someone to attend court and also time delays and specialised courts as well. Thank you. Um, Rhonda Lusting, um, can I say that this is one of the areas in which I think health and social care can really impact and have um, a, a good deal of support in, um, for, for, for this bill. This bill is, is, is based purely almost on criminal justice outcomes. Um, and with better health and social care input, actually we can support men and women to be able to make choices which are, which are better suited to their circumstances. So if we are able to support them and support them quickly and, and early, we're able to support them through um, uh, deciding on civil justice measures, deciding on criminal justice measures, and deciding on the best things that fit their family. And that means moving their family into safety and their family away from abuse and living a life that's happy. Now, sometimes that actual journey might take 20 years because some of the after effects of what's happened from repeated abuse, repeated coercive control, which has been, when we look at research, has been linked to the same types of abuse as um, torture, that the after effects of coercive control can have a significant impact not only on the person, the adult person in the household, but on the children in the household. And this is where health and social care absolutely must step in to support these families, support the families to criminal justice, and to support the families through that and to health better and better health comes afterward. I'll just yes, add briefly from NSPCC's point of view and for children that, um, and it's just to evidence that special measures do work, we run a Young Witness Service and um, that provides support for children and through their entire journey through the criminal justice system and making sure that special measures are in place for them, like remote video link, um, recording of their evidence in advance, this kind of thing. And it does work and it helps uh, keep those children with their cases through to the end. And I'll add that um, just another point that one of, the, one of the main enemies of completion of cases is delay and the extraordinarily long length of time that cases can take through the Northern Ireland court system. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. And just before I go back to Jerry for an additional question, a check on the phone. Is there any additional questions on the phone at this point? No. Okay. Uh, so, Jerry, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, just around the, the reasonable defence clause, uh, you raised some concern, thank yourself, Chair. Um, is, the, is the panel concerned that there could be a possibility this could be used by a defence to maybe excuse uh, domestic violence? Um, I mean, there's a concern that it's in the bill, I think, generally. Um, I'm not a legal expert, but I would imagine that there has to be a reasonable uh, challenge to any uh, accusation um, of domestic violence in a court. So is there a necessity for that in the, cl in the legislation, in the bill? Um, and, and at the very least, would the panel think that if it is to remain, um, that there needs to be detailed specifics of uh, when it can be used? Thanks. Thank you. And I suppose... Just we're near the end, but we're settling into a bit of a rhythm. We'll go to Sonia first, maybe, on that one. Um, okay. Can you hear me, Chair? Yes, you're good there. That. My point. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, we are concerned about the Clause 12 and the defence of grounds of reasonableness and how it could be used, possibly, um, by someone, especially, um, you know, the defence could use it um, if they're pleading reasonableness, if they feel that things aren't going their way, or to portray a, portray a victim or someone, you know, who is mentally up, unstable. And if you think of a lot of the, the, you know, women that we would work with, they may be on antidepressants, they may have anxiety and panic attacks, and, um, you know, cause the mental health issues are caused because of, you know, the domestic violence and abuse they're living with. So 
we do have great concerns around this and we would we would like the wording to be adopted and for you know um, the Department of Justice to take into consideration the legislation to protect anyone from an abusive partner making untrue allegations you know in their defense so um, it is one of the things that um, we raised very much at the start and I think um, other people do certainly have um, issues around it so we would welcome um, further clarity from um, the Department of Justice with regard to to this to ensure there's safeguards there. Thank you. Thank you. And Neil? Um, and the way the question was pitched, uh, you definitely got to uh, the concerns that we would share right at the very end of it and that there needs to be much more detail um, than what is currently there. Um, there's always going to be a balance of what's in the legislation versus what lies behind it, but certainly in guidance there would need to be a lot more detail because what is there at the minute, if there was nothing else, that would be wide open to um, misuse in cases. Thank you, Neil. And finally, Rhonda? I, I think it's interesting um, in that the reason for it is, is you know, the, the reason is of course sound, um, but it's the what goes underneath and whether it's going to be used in, in a spurious way. So when we consider that many of those people that it might be used against, maybe people with disabilities um, or other and further multiple barriers toward justice, we have to really ensure that um, the, the use of this defence is very, you know, very stringently looked at and examined. Um, and perhaps that could be done as a sidebar or it could be that, that the burden should certainly be placed upon those using it um, prior to being used. I do, I do think, there's, I think there's real merit in it being there, but I think um, we must be sure that victim-blaming myths, um, myths about who, you know, who victims might be or what an ideal or perfect victim might be and mental health, health issues or disability, things like that, might not be painted into a place where that could become a reasonable, a reasonable clause. Okay, thank you. And thank you very much, panel, for your presentations and for your answers to every question that was pitched your way today. And also, I suppose, to thank you on behalf of the committee for the work you do day in, day out in this hugely important uh, area of work. Uh, again, similar to this morning, this, this is an, ext an area of concern, a very marginalised, very vulnerable group of people. And uh, on, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you all for the work you do and for your presentation today. And all the best for now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, members. So, um, members, I can now advise that uh, there is an official from the Department of Health here today to brief the committee on the health and social care aspects of the bill, and that an official from the Department of Justice is also here to address any other issues on the bill that members may wish to raise. And for information, the bill papers are at tab 11 of your pack today, members. And I have to say, it's a delight to welcome real human people here in front of us. It's, it's a, we, we, we hugely appreciate people coming in on the phone, but it does add a layer of, of difficulty. So thank you very much for coming along today. And I'd like to welcome Lisa Truman from the Adult Safeguarding Un Unit in the Department of Health and Ms. Veronica Holland, Head of Victims and Witnesses of Crime in the Department of Justice. And I'd just like to invite you now to go ahead and brief the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, um, and for the opportunity to brief the committee this afternoon. As you've said, I'm Policy Lead for Domestic Abuse in the Department of Health, and with me is my colleague Veronica Holland from the Department of Justice. Veronica has kindly agreed to attend today's session um, to answer any queries that the committee may have on the specifics of the bill, at least with the clauses, for example which, as members will be aware, was introduced to the Assembly by the Justice Minister. Um, I'm conscious the committee has already heard quite a lot about the bill um, this afternoon from stakeholder briefings, so I don't intend to take up too much time in terms of an opening statement, but there are some small points which I think might be helpful just to make at the outset, um, just when considering the key aims of the bill from a health perspective. So, whilst this was a justice bill, tackling domestic abuse does continue to be a collective cross-government effort. The department works very closely with the Department of Justice um, to deliver the Stopping Domestic and Sexual Violence uh, and Abuse Strategy, and that is also working in partnership with the Department for Education and for Communities. 
And it would be remiss of me as well not to acknowledge the tremendous contribution from our statutory voluntary and community sector partners who were involved in the development of this legislation and represented on the multi-agency working group, as was the department um, during their initial policy development phase. That was in 2016 and 17. Um, I think continuing with that multi-agency approach will be important if the aims of this bill are to be achieved. Um, as we've heard this afternoon, uh, domestic abuse cuts across many policy areas, so not just health and justice, but also education and housing, and that's just to name a few. Of particular interest to the Department is the creation of the new domestic abuse offence in Part 1. Um, and while I'm conscious that changes to criminal procedures and sentencing regimes are not strictly within the remit of the department, we, we would support its overall premise. Uh, any form of domestic abuse is completely unacceptable, so it is important that the offence includes criminalising patterns of coercive and controlling behaviour as well as physical abuse, so this is a significant step forward. Psychological, emotional or financial abuse is just, of, just as harmful, if not more so. And it has been very challenging to prosecute under existing laws. So the bill will better reflect how victims experience domestic abuse and it should help to close that gap. The department would also be supportive of the child aggravator in particular, which is associated with the offence. As set out in clause 9, this would mean that the sentence could be increased up to the maximum available. This will apply where a victim is under the age of 18. It would also apply where a child sees, hears or is present during an incident of abuse where they are used to abuse another person or where abusive behaviour is directed at them. And the department welcomes that the bill recognises the adverse impact that domestic abuse can have on children and young people. As the new offence is introduced, there will be a very important opportunity to raise awareness um, to send a message to victims that they will be believed and taken seriously, but also to make it absolutely clear to perpetrators that there is zero tolerance for domestic abuse in our society. And public awareness raising will be taken forward primarily by the Department of Justice as part of the operationalisation of the, the offence. I also believe it's the Department's intention to reconvene a multi-agency working group to inform the implementation phase, and the Department of Health will be represented on that. And it will also be important as part of that work to look at uh, what's happened across the water and obviously down south as well, and to, to share, share learning there um, where the offence has already been introduced. As outlined in Clause 25, statutory guidance will also be developed by the Department of Justice and we in Health will work very closely with our justice colleagues to ensure that healthcare professionals have a shared understanding and consistent understanding about the context and impact of the offence and in particular the nature of coercive and controlling behaviour. Depending on what that final piece of legislation looks like, additional, additional training may also need to be considered. This wouldn't just be for health, this would be for the police, for example, um, for housing. Um, as I said before, domestic abuse cuts across many policy areas. And that work will begin over the summer to develop that implementation plan. I think it might be helpful at this point, Chair, to update the committee on a training programme that the Department is currently piloting with GP practices. Depending on its evaluation, this might be something that we can build on as the new offence is introduced. The IRIS pilot, which stands for Identification and Referral to Improve Safety, is being co-produced with Women's Aid as the lead agency, working in partnership with Victim Support, Men's Advisory Project and Nexus NI. The pilot it involves two advocate educators working across practices in two GP federations. They will receive patient referrals and, importantly, they will provide training to the practice teams so that they are better equipped to identify and respond to domestic and sexual abuse. And helpfully, this training already includes training around the nature of coercive and controlling behaviour as proposed in, in the offence. And I suppose I'm using general practice as an example because GPs are in a unique position to help victims and survivors get the support that they need. Someone affected by domestic abuse may go to their GP with a variety of symptoms that are not obviously connected, um, such as anxiety, depression, stress, and we've heard of examples this afternoon. However, many will not disclose that without being directly asked, so by better equipping GPs to ask the question, um, it means that there's more avenues open for support, and, and many GPs are, are already doing this, but we're hoping that our pilot um, will enhance that. We do already have a routine inquiry in place across maternity services in all trusts, so expectant mothers during and after pregnancy are given the opportunity to disclose abuse 
and similarly seek help and get support. So there are models to build on, and it is hoped that once evaluated, the IRIS pilot will provide a good evidence base to inform any future guidance and training needs that may be required as a result of this legislation. The intended effect of the legislation is more reporting of domestic abuse, um, and as we've heard from PSNI statistics, there ha has already been an increase in incidents in Northern Ireland, but of course this isn't the full picture, as many incidents still go unreported. So it is difficult to predict exactly what the increased levels will, will look like, but I understand the Department of Justice anticipates an uplift of approximately 3% in the annual number of domestic abuse incidents and crimes already reported to the police, a significant number of which may already be in the system for other offences. Increased reporting and awareness raising could have a knock-on effect. We could see an increase in demand for services, again, not just across health, but potentially housing and our voluntary community sector. And we do want more victims to come forward, and we want them to get that help and support. It could result in more opportunities for frontline services to intervene earlier, more prosecutions, and therefore a reduction in the number of repeat victims. And I understand that monitoring and reviewing reporting once the offence is introduced will be taken forward. So in closing, the Department is supportive of the overall aims of the legislation. It is a significant development and an opportunity to close a gap in the law to ensure that protection for victims is not limited to just cases of physically violent behaviour. And this is needed now more than ever as the message to stay at home in response to COVID-19 brings new challenges for people experiencing domestic abuse. So that concludes my opening remarks, Chair. Veronica and I would be very happy to take any questions that members may have. Thank you, um, Lisa. And I suppose my first question you have partly dealt with in terms of the training that, that would be required because there will clearly be an impact on health and social care staff in relation to this bill. Are there so you have referred to training for GPs and for maternity. Are there any plans to extend that to other other uh, interfaces where people might and I'm thinking particularly maybe emergency departments or out of hours where people who are victims of abuse sometimes may go in order to avoid the conversation with the GP. So, and, and also, are there any systems in place to track maybe multiple visits to emergency departments and things like that that might act as a, as a red flag where abuse may be, where something may be going on? I suppose the first thing to say is that we'll need to look at the statutory guidance that would need to be in place to see what that looks like, and then that would inform whether health would need to take any specific guidance forward as well. And then from that would stem whether there be any training needs. And, and that hasn't been scoped at the minute. We are setting up, as um, I mentioned before, Department of Justice will be setting up a multi-agency uh, working group, and we hope to look through the implementation plan as the summer progresses on that. Um, Training is an important part of domestic abuse, and, and that is why we've already committed funding for a pilot for GPs. Um, I'm on, I do think that um, in potentially one of the areas there is a pilot being taken forward in an A&E um, to place an advocate in, in, I think it might be Craigavon, but I, I'd need to check that. Um, so that, again, is another, another source where we could see how things work and get evidence to inform any future training needs. There, there would be already quite a bit of training. Now, it's not necessarily rolled out from the department, but the local domestic and sexual violence partnerships, for example, they would take forward um, a lot of seminars and conferences, and they would have already had training delivered on coercive and controlling behaviour. That, as itself, as a concept, is not a new thing. The new thing here is that we're legislating for it. So a lot of good work has already been done. I think what we need to do now is, is scope that, review what has been done, and see what, where the gaps are and what needs to be built on. In terms of the point about reporting, um, I am aware of some, of some areas where, and this isn't in Northern Ireland, I'm just conscious that in some areas there are maybe reporting systems where a flag is put on a note, you know, like whether it's a, a red dot on a physical piece of paper so people know um, that there were domestic abuse incidents there. We've tried to incorporate something like that with the ARIS pilot where that is recorded so we can see the numbers coming through. Um, I suppose that would be something down the line that we would need to, to look at more wide scale. Okay, thank you. And in, in relation to the GP issue, uh, the outset of the COVID-19 crisis highlighted a significant gap in terms of, certainly within my own constituency from Anna South to own, large numbers of people who had came here over recent years, young, healthy families, working age families who had never registered with a GP okay. and are therefore outside of that system. Has there been any consideration given to how you might reach into those harder to reach communities? 
It's a very good point that you raised, Chair. Um, no, not in the context of the bill. Um, it is something that I could go away and, and talk to our primary care colleagues about. It wouldn't necessarily registration with GPs wouldn't necessarily sit with me, but I'm happy to look into it. Yeah. And then my second question is probably more to Veronica. So, clause 12 has been mentioned there several times throughout the presentation, and it provides for exceptions where a course of behaviour may be reasonable, such as where interventions by a partner. For example, may be necessary in case of mental illness and or addiction. Has the department considered how this will impact on those in particular health circumstances or those with disabilities? I suppose that part of it maybe is to you, Lisa. Where the alleged abuser is the cure or those with health problems, including mental health problems and substance addiction. And then in terms of the part of it to Veronica is what safeguards are in place to protect such vulnerable people from abuse where the abuser claims the defence of reasonable behaviour by claiming the, that the abuse of action was in the person's interest. So well, in parts. terms of that defence provision more generally, um, in, in terms of the, the way in which the bill is drafted, generally we've tried to build in a number of kind of safeguards and protections, both in relation to how the offence itself will, will operate, but also in terms of how that um, defence will operate, and, and obviously appreciate the concerns that have been expressed by voluntary sector partners. I suppose if it's any reassurance to members around the table, similar defence provisions are in place in other jurisdictions across the rest of the UK. So both Scotland, England and Wales have um, a defence provision which is very similarly crafted um, to the one that we have in the bill at the moment. I suppose that the key thing is always going to be in the first instance, police and PPS will have to be um, convinced that there is abusive behaviour there in order to bring that case forward in the first interest in, in the first place that it is in the public interest and that there's evidence um, they consider that, that would allow that, that case to be taken forward. In relation to the application of the defence itself, it won't simply be enough for an individual to state that they were acting reasonably. There will be an onus on that individual to provide evidence of that. That will have to be considered by the court and the court will have to be satisfied that in the particular circumstances of the case that that behaviour was reasonable. That is on the basis of that that behaviour wouldn't be um, considered to be abusive. So, you know, our sense is in, in terms of kind of the the various um, layers that are involved in, in terms of both how the offence itself will apply and how that defence will interact with it. I think we are, are satisfied that it shouldn't um, be open to abuse. It's obviously something that we will want to, to also, as Lisa has said, um, cover in, in the guidance in terms of the types of scenarios um, that we would envisage that applying. But as I say, the, the key consideration will be that an individual presenting that will have to provide evidence to the court as to why um, that defence is being used and that the behaviour in those particular circumstances was reasonable. Okay. And in relation to the sort of health aspects where mental health or addictions or things in terms of the Department of Health, Lisa? I think just to pick up on what Veronica said there, Chair, about the statutory guidance, I think it will be important that that sets out what the evidence base that is required um, is included in that and the effect that mental health, for example, or disability um, might play on that. So I think that might be something for, for statutory guidance down the line. And potentially training for people working with those particular groups in relation to the domestic violence. Yeah, it, sure. it, 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 it. OK, thank you. I'm going to now go to come to members. And uh, first of all, of Paula. Um, thank you. Thank you, ladies, for coming along today. My first one is for you, Lisa, and it's in relation to your talk there about women who have just given birth and you know, the, the tricky conversations around domestic abuse. And I'm just wondering, is the department then going to be looking at um, asking the trust to commission postnatal contraceptive services? Because we know that a lot of men will use pregnancy as a way of coercive control. I'm just wondering, who's pushing th that through now? It's a very interesting point that you've raised. I have to admit that's not something that we've given consideration to as part of this bill. Um, as I said before, I think a lot of that work will be taken forward over the summer in terms of what implementation will look like, for not just for the health service, but for the likes of housing and obviously justice as well and education. Um, but it's not something that we've we've given consideration to, but I'll, I'll certainly look into it. Okay, thank you. Um, and the second question is for, you, for yourself, Ron, again, that's in relation to Clause 9, and obviously I was delighted to see that aggravator, um, child aggravator clause included, so where, where they have been used to abuse another person. Could you give us um, an indication of how you're going to categorise what that abuse looks like? Are, like? are you going to put examples in the bill or the guidance in terms of 
how that abuse would manifest itself where a child has been used? Well, with the guidance generally, you know, the purpose of that will be very much to expand on and, and supplement what's in, in the bill per se. In terms of what's deemed to be abusive behaviour, it will ultimately come back to the provisions that are set out earlier in the bill. And, and we've, we've quite detailed provisions um, in clauses two and three, I think it is, in, in terms of what's deemed to be abusive behaviour and what the effects of that are. So everything will essentially have to come back to that, um, whether or not that behaviour is abusive, so whether it's violent, it's threatening, it's directed at his child, it has a number of, of purposes, and some of the, the relevant effects associated with that relate to making individuals dependent on another, subordination of them, isolation, controlling them, uh, restricting their freedom of action, uh, making them feel frightened, humiliated, degraded. So I suppose in, in terms of abusive behaviour under the offence generally, whether or not it's looked at in the context of a um, relationship where a young person is involved or is in the context of the aggravator, ultimately everything will come back to those abusive behaviour provisions. And I suppose in, in that context, um, if members don't mind, I'll perhaps touch on the issue that was raised around the statutory definition. Um, we quite deliberately um, haven't included a, a definition of, of what is domestic abuse within the bill. Um, we had had discussions with all of our voluntary sector partners before finalising that. If we took that view because essentially at the moment, as I say, there is a very detailed um, two clauses in the bill in terms of what is abusive behaviour, what are the relevant effects. If you were to include a, a definition of domestic abuse in the bill, it would effectively be the introduction of a sentence or a, a very, very brief clause um, in the bill which would say domestic abuse means and tie into the definition or, the, or those clauses related to, to abusive behaviour within the bill more generally. We're of the view effectively we are, are clearly setting out within the bill what is within the scope of abusive behaviour and what that would look like. It's something obviously that we would want to give further consideration to and, and further elaborate on in, in terms of the guidance and, and we will of course want to look at that in the context of the, the um, cases that are involving young people under the age of 18 and also where the, the child aggravator is applying more generally. Chair, just go back quickly. I suppose I'm thinking in the context then of the first responders that the that the panel were talking about there. You know, if they could get some understanding of what it looks like and, and the reality of a child, as yeah. opposed to on the face of a bill, it's, I think it would be easier for them to be able to spot yeah. and then articulate where it's been, um, where it's actually taken place. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Jerry. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for the presentations. Just uh, three quick questions. Um, Section 75 groups, as far as I understand, there's no recording of data uh, of domestic violence uh, against them, um, LGB and T people, um, uh, women with disabilities and so forth. So is there, is there any work being done around the bill to address that? Um, is there any work or any proposals or, su or suggestions around preventative measures uh, and can they be added uh, to the bill? And just finally, um, we see you said obviously the, the cross cutting nature of, of this issue and um, the, the bill as well. Um, in terms of educational campaigns and awareness raising campaigns, um, are you aware of any discussions so far in the Department of Education uh, and what role will uh, the Department of Health play in sort of helping to deliver that or to triumph that or, or, or whatever? Thanks. To start. In terms of the Section 75 aspect, um, that's certainly something that we can have discussions with our statutory sector partners in terms of police and, and PPS in terms of what can be recorded. Um, certainly in, in terms of what we would hope through the, the offence is that it will become much clearer going forward how many individuals are subject to this. Uh, the more obvious categories such as age and gender will obviously um, be provided for, but we can certainly have discussions with them in, in terms of what else may be possible in, in terms of uh, recording of Section 75 um, aspects, and, and we'll have further discussions with them. In terms of the preventative measures, what type of thing are you thinking of there? I'm asking, <laughs> has it been discussed? I mean, I don't know what could be put in a bill, to be honest, around domestic violence, but obviously preventative uh, prevention is better than, you know, um, necessary punishment, if you will. Yeah. But, uh, and, and I suppose probably the big aspect there for us would really be around the awareness raising and the yeah. advertising campaign that, that we'll take forward in, in relation to that. I think a key thing in, in this area generally and, and specifically in relation to the domestic abuse offence is ensuring that as many departments are involved in this as possible. Obviously, in terms of taking forward the work under the strategy, there are good working relationships with a, a number of departments, very close working relationships between justice and health, um, but also the involvement of communities, um, education, and the Department of Finance. We're also having discussions in relation to the involvement of DERA. And I suppose the more that can be done through 
um, work in that area generally to try and raise awareness of this as an issue and ensure people know that this type of behaviour is wrong, particularly in, in relation to the, the education side of things. You know, the more that can be done in, in, in that field, the better. It isn't something that we would intend, I suppose, to specifically reference in the, the bill itself, but I suppose what I, I would say is or, or provide reassurance in, in terms of the ongoing work between departments in relation to, to trying to address this issue more, more generally and, and by virtue of that, um, you know, try and reduce the numbers that are, are coming through the system. I suppose the other thing that we're hoping in, in terms of the bill itself and the offence is to try and capture a number of behaviours that at present aren't criminal. Um, but obviously are, you know, are, are wrong and, and couldn't be agreed to by anybody. I think our hope would be very much that cases are being caught at a much earlier stage. And as I say, through the awareness raising campaign that we would take forward, that many more people are aware that this is um, you know, what is deemed to be right and wrong in, in terms of, of relationships and I suppose increasing awareness among the general public more generally would be a key aim of that. Um, if I can just pick up then on the point about preventative measures, as Veronica has said, there's a lot of good work already being done, um, and I suppose it's maybe not necessarily something to put in a piece of legislation, but rather under the domestic stopping domestic and sexual violence and abuse strategy, we do publish yearly action plans. Those are published jointly between health and justice, and within those will be a range of actions, and one of the strands is about early intervention and prevention, and that's where we would have actions from DE, for example. So it may be that as the legislation is taken forward in future action plans, we will look to insert me measures that would complement the bill through that route, as opposed to necessarily putting it in legislation. Um, on the, the cross-cutting nature and the campaigns, completely agree. Um, it is definitely a cross-cutting issue. The departments work very closely together, particularly health and justice. Um, I haven't had any specific discussions with DE in relation to campaigns to date. However, we will all have to have that discussion as the bill progresses. Um, what I would say is um, DOJ and also the PSNI have had recent campaigns. I think they're ongoing, particularly around the, the COVID response. And the Department of Health does work closely with Justice on that to ensure that there's key messages coming across that would, would complement both. So we'd, we'd agree in terms of joined up approach. Thank you. Um, going to go across to Pam now, but I just want to give the, the members on the phone a wee heads up that I will come to you there next to check if you have questions on this section, just a bit of forewarning. So go ahead, Pam. Thanks, Chair, and thank you both for your attendance here today. Um, and thank you for the the work that you've done to date. I know that um, you both have been working on this for uh, probably an awful lot longer than people would ever realise or know, so thank you for that and for your uh, cooperation working together on it. And I'm very glad to hear, Veronica, about uh, uh, the cross-departmental working and looking at the issue as a whole, because at the end of the day, yes, this legislation is absolutely vital, but what we really want is that awareness to be out there and for people to understand that this type of behaviour against whomever, whatever sex, whatever the scenario, is not acceptable. Um, and we need to make it very much socially unacceptable. And I think that's where we'll see the real wins in the future yeah. when we get to that point where people realise actually that, that's, that's not right, that's not acceptable, and learn to even speak out against others who are, who are behaving in that way. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to ask, um, in around the Department of Health, um, have said they intended to amend the Children's Order uh, 1995 to change definition of harm to include a child seeing or hearing ill treatment or harm to someone else. Obviously, this will dovetail then with the provision with the domestic abuse bill. Um, in what areas would the bill, as it stands, have synergies with the Department of Health's remit and? Um, what, in terms of legislative changes, can be made to streamline justice and health legislation in the same area? Sorry, just to clarify, do you mean in, do you mean what the remit is in relation to the domestic abuse bill or the adoption and children bill? Sorry. Um, I suppose um, if you could tell us um, what the, the synergies are be between the two first, and then is there anything then coming from that that can be um, improved? and streamline to bring it all together? I think probably the key aspect in relation to that and, and the aspect of that children's order that you're making reference to in terms of um, seeing the ill treatment or harm of another, um, you know, as you say, that will dovetail very well with the aspect in the bill whereby 
um, you know, there is coverage in, in terms of where a child sees, hears, or is present for domestic abuse having occurred, you know, so being able to make provision for that through the, the statutory aggravator and potentially increasing the sentence associated with that, you know, I, I think those two areas will, will naturally kind of cover um, a range of common ground um, around that is, is, is probably kind of the, um, the main things in, in terms of that aspect between the, the two sides. Anything else, Lisa? Okay. Um, I suppose um, you have heard the presentations earlier as well. If you, if you any contract, we understand there is no funding resource attached to the bill. Um, but I mean, I would have serious concerns. I know we've raised this a few times about you know, especially given the pandemic we're in and the effect that uh, this is having on fundraising for third sector organisations. That we know. You know, once restrictions ease further, we would expect to see you know a greater uptake in that looking for help and assistance. And uh, you know, is is there anything that either your departments are doing or are you talking together about um, looking at support mechanisms to ensure that those third sector organisations are there in order to deliver on, on that help when the, when the time comes when people are effectively released. Um, and are able to seek that help? I suppose, I mean, Veronica and I are both very aware that the message to stay at home not only has an impact on victims, but it also has an impact on the services that are providing support. And we do continue to engage regularly with those, um, those voluntary and community sector organisations, both at an individual level and also we meet through forums, teleconferences on a regular basis. Um, I suppose the focus to date since the COVID-19 outbreak has really been more around promotional activity on our part in terms of trying to get the message out that just because you're staying at home doesn't mean you can't reach out and get help and support. But you're absolutely right, as, as the weeks and days move on, we do need to start looking towards recovery plan. And actually just on an interagency conversation this morning we had, um, there are plans now to start looking at that. Um, in terms of funding, there is nothing specific that justice and health have, we don't have a joint pot as such. Um, however, would be aware of um, the Department for Communities would have some funding initiatives. So I know recently that, that they announced that there would be additional funding for supporting people. And I know that's where refuges fall under. Mm -hmm. I understand that as part of that, the Department for Communities are asking service providers um, what their current and future pressures are likely to be. Um, obviously, refuges will, will wish to respond to that, and then it will be down to communities to work out how they allocate that funding. There is also a further pot in terms of a wider communities fund, um, so that I think that is for, for charities that are, are struggling during this current, current pandemic. Um, I do not think the criteria as such have been developed yet. I do know it is going to be an open comp competition or an open application process. Um, but as I say, that's that's what the Department for Communities are, are taking forward. So there are bigger, wider pots available. Um, I suppose we will have to continue monitoring call levels to helplines and um, to other organisations as the weeks go on to see what that recovery plan looks like and if anything additional is required. Okay. And just finally, can I ask you, um, do you do you suspect or do you think that there will be amendments placing statutory obligations on bodies to provide emergency accommodation to victims? Do you do you expect that to be coming forward? And I suppose in terms the of the, the, the bill itself, you know, the, the committee process, a, a number of issues will will probably be raised and, and touched on, um, akin to those that have been um, dealt with today. You know, for example, the issue of secure tenancies was 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 raised, and that is something that you know, as as has been referenced, it, it's not in the bill. It's an issue that we have. Uh, raised with the Communities Minister to get an issue in relation to that. I suppose what I would say in terms of the bill that is before um, the Assembly at the moment, the, the Minister has been very, very keen to get the domestic abuse offence in place as soon as possible. She has indicated in a number of areas that she is perhaps not minded to take certain things forward. Equally, she has indicated there are other areas where she would be minded to make progress in, in relation to this area, but is not minded to conclude it in the domestic abuse bill, rather would leave that for um, a future legislative vehicle, more than likely the, the miscellaneous provisions bill that will be the next justice bill that's, that's brought forward through the Assembly. You know, so, for example, the issue of domestic abuse protection notices and orders is something that is provided for in the Westminster Bill. The Minister has indicated that you know, she would be keen to see how that operates in um, Westminster once, or in, sorry, in England and Wales once that's piloted, but certainly um, you know, I think we'd be keen to see that being brought forward in a future piece of, of legislation in relation to the, the issue 
year around the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, on, on which there was quite a bit of, of discussion, as the, the panel members um, alluded to. It's not something that the Minister is minded to take forward at this stage. I think for a, a number of reasons in terms of the size of Northern Ireland, the engagement that we have with our voluntary community and statutory sector partners. Um, the fact that we have, uh, uh, in, in a number of areas, one regional um, Northern Ireland-wide service as opposed to disparate services, the Commissioner in, in England and Wales is, is very much focused, I suppose, on, on trying to ensure that there's consistency of services across that jurisdiction, which is obviously much, much larger. Um, having said that, she has asked us to kind of look at and scope what um, alternative provision may be made, so um, perhaps something akin to the mental health champion, looking at whether or not something like that could be brought forward in a domestic and sexual abuse context. Um, so, as I say, there, there are other issues that, that members have, um, or the, the panel member um, had raised today. Um, you know, the issue around uh, an advocacy service, that is something that um, some of the members around the table will be aware that the Department of Justice is looking at in conjunction with other departments. That isn't something that's going to be in, in legislation, but it's something that we're going to, to bring forward. So I, I suppose in, in terms of those various miscellaneous issues that were being, um, and miscellaneous is, is probably not the right word, the other issues that were being raised by panel members, on some of those, they are things that we are minded to take forward, just not in terms of, of this specific piece of legislation. Other aspects, the Minister is, has asked that, that we look at um, possible um, alternatives, um, you know, but obviously keen that, you know, and there is a need for a wide range of measures being brought forward across the board. Um, and as I say, on, on the issue of secure tenants, these refuge provision more generally, that would be a, an issue for Department for Communities and is something that we, that the Minister has raised with the Communities Minister and we're waiting on a response back in relation to that, because we know obviously there is a, a particular interest from um, members and across the board more generally in relation to that. Thank okay. you. And just as a, as a follow-up to that, what funding is in place for the Domestic Abuse Strategy and Action Plan? Well, Chair, there is no central pot of funding for that strategy's implementation. Um, each of the departments that are involved in statutory organisations will fund their own initiatives. Um, so, for example, the Department of Health, they would fund, we would part fund the Domestic and Sexual Abuse Helpline um, alongside Department of Justice and Department for Communities. We also part fund MARAC, so Multi-Agency Risk Assessment Conferences. Um, again, that's part funded with Justice and the Police. Um, we continue to core fund to voluntary and community sector organisations um, for this year. and. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, we were able to secure funding this year for the IRIS pilot, so each, each department will take forward um, their own initiatives and their own costings, but there is no central, central budget overall. I and suppose in terms of just from a justice perspective, to mention some of the pieces of work that, that we are taking forward, as I alluded to, we're looking at a um, advocacy support service. The cost of that is probably going to be in the region of about eight hundred pound, um, which would be funded subject to the agreement um, of police and ourselves. Would be funded by the two departments in terms of taking that forward. There's also work being undertaken in relation to behavioural change programmes, working in conjunction um, with the probation board and health trusts. Um, that has run for the last year and this year. So I suppose there, each of the departments, is, as Lisa says, there's, there's no kind of central pot as such, but each of the departments and you know, our, our partner bodies are looking at a range of um, work areas and, and, and taking forward um, those pieces of work and, and putting in the necessary monies associated with that. Yeah, I suppose it, it, it kind of speaks to a bit of lack of joined up. Well, there's no central pot, even if we could establish what is being spent across a range of departments, you could at least then track in terms of progress or impact or whatever on that. So maybe. What I would say is we do have a strategic delivery board, so that's a senior officials group from across the different departments, and they get they get together. I think it's um, once every quarter. So we would keep track of the different projects and funding that would be taken forward. It would be through that mechanism. And could you get that to us? The, that figure, what it, what's being spent currently across um, we can certainly range? Certainly, ask the departments if they will contribute to to a collated response. And Just to get an idea, it allows us then to, to measure how it's being how it's being delivered as this as this rolls out. Um, so I'm going to go across to the phones there and I'll check with Orlea for Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber. Okay, members, thank you for uh, coming back promptly. So we're still looking at the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, the committee deliberation. We've been asked to respond to the Committee for Justice by the 5th of June 2020. So we really need to complete our consideration of the bill this afternoon in order to come to a view. The clerk will then write up a report for approval at next week's meeting in order to meet the deadline. I would remind members that we have been asked to tie our comments to the clauses of the bill rather than offer commentary on domestic abuse policy more generally. So again, the papers are at tab 11. And I'll just open open up to members in, in relation to their thoughts in to, relation to what we have heard this afternoon. Alan. I think, Chair, the uh, thing that uh, came out today during the, the question and answer session is the uh, one of the big obstacles is the length of time that it takes to actually bring a case uh, to court. Um, and it must be an extremely uh, dreadful experience for uh, a victim to, to have to maybe sweat literally for a year and a half or two years for a case to be brought to court. So I think that's something that we should maybe highlight, that we, we would like to see uh, some form of, of, of I know that the, the, they are looking, the Lord Chief Justice is looking at the whole court system to try and speed prosecutions up, but I think this is one in particular that does need special attention. The other one is the, oh, that's not me, sorry, that's, I beg your pardon. Uh, the other thing that um, the other thing is that the I'm sorry, but that sure. The other thing is the um, I've lost my thread now. Um, the, yes, the one of the speakers talked about uh, the system uh, in England where they have uh, victims' advocates. I think that's a super idea, and I think it, it would be good if if I, I know it's maybe not part of the it wouldn't be part of the bill, but Maybe, maybe it could be incorporated in the bill, but I certainly uh, I would like to see that uh, being uh, brought to bear here in Northern Ireland. Alex? <coughs> yeah, I, I'm happy enough with the bill as far as it goes, but I'm disappointed certain bits are not in it. So, um, you know, there's no funding for this once it's put in place, so I think that needs to be highlighted. 
um, as I mentioned to you, I do think that the bit about um, victims and housing should be included. And I don't see why it can't be, because you've got justice and health working together, and justice are bringing it through, so why can't the communities add that bit to it? So I would like that mentioned to them to see what they say. So that's my two big issues, really. OK, well, we'll just take, a, I suppose, a round of views, and then we can discuss uh, procedurally how we, how, we, how we go forward with it. I'll check in on the phones there with Orlea and Pat, if either of you have anything that you want to add or comment on at this stage. Orlea, are you there? Yes, Chair, sure, I'm here, thanks. Um, well, um, I mean, I would be broadly supportive of um, the bill. I think it's a good bill. It's, it's timely, particularly in the context of, obviously, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, and I know in the one I asked the panel earlier, just about, obviously, the issues around mental health um, are going to weave right through um, the entire bill, and it should. Um, and then the issue around the, um, the statutory pay for victims of, of domestic violence, so it says that that, that has been looked at. Um, but I think the point that you have made, sure at the beginning of the earlier presentation, just around the, the awareness, well, a couple of the members touched on it, but the, um, the awareness and the, the educational programme that needs to flow from it as well for families and young people. Okay, thank you. Orlea. Pat, a check in with you there, just if you have anything you want to contribute at this yeah. point. No, I'd be fairly happy enough with the bill as it stands and then allow the uh, members on the floor of the Assembly uh, to change it if necessary. OK. Anything else then from... Uh, yeah, Jerry, Jerry? Come back yeah. to you, Pam. Um, just on, on the Commissioner, um, I think there's obviously a lot of um, discussion about the Domestic Abuse Commissioner, so I don't know if we be right to seek more commentary on that. I don't know what the propose or what the procedure is. But I would like some more information on that myself. Um and also the reasonable defence clause. I think there's some concerns about that. So uh, those are concerns that I would have generally. I think you raise some concerns yourself, Chair, and I think others as well. Um so I'm not convinced whether that's needed in in the legislation, but so a bit more information around that uh, if possible would be useful. Okay, and Pam Yeah um, I'm just kind of worried that um uh, but Veronica was saying there, there's, you know, we, we do know there's more than one way to skin a cat, and there may be um, better modes of travel for different parts that we initially might think belong with this bill, but they might be better elsewhere. Um, I don't know. But I'm just wondering, is stalking included in this bill? Um, Chair, uh, Naomi's brother, Justice Minister, is bringing forward a separate just, um, stalking bill later this year. Now, and I too would like to see the the, the bit around the housing and the emergency accommodation. But uh, also, I don't know whether th there are there, there obviously are barriers. Um, in terms of, um, obviously, that's with communities, and maybe we have a different Scott. system. It doesn't quite match up. Yeah. But I think we would all like to see these types of um, additions to it. But whether that practically works, I don't know. Well. Maybe suggest if members agree that we go into closed session just for to take some advice in terms of the procedural elements. There's a lot of issues there that are kind of a wee bit unclear where they fit, do they fit, yeah. how else might they might they be progressed. So with members' agreement, maybe we'll go into closed session to have a discussion on that. Yes, yeah, sir. members agree. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly yeah, Senate Mr. Chamber Programme Sound. Um, agree or, or want to include it in the, in the RO? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
probably are the bills missing. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. Maybe proposed after whatever, what others think as well. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. <laughs>